And I'm like, uh, who do you think taught James Lipton how to run a brothel? For that matter, who doesn't like to take the proverbial stroll through a coin village with a spring in your step, a flamethrower, maybe some napalm to make it faster? Hey, like Dr. Manhattan and the comedian letting off a little steam. The problem, gentlemen, uh, ladies, uh, I'd love to tap that tambourine. What? Oh, I said, hold on there, professor. Yours is a delightful plan and sound, efficient, and cold-hearted. I mean, I really like this guy. One small detail, if we carpet bomb them with the latest show and sell from Zorg Industries, uh, we may fall short of a quorum. I mean, the last thing anyone's ever called me is a parliamentarian, but technically, according to Hoyle, uh, don't we need enough to sign off on the safety specs for the new fleet and the uh, vaccine? You're ruthless, brother, and I love that about you. But when collateral damage includes too many members of the board, I mean, that's not Queensbury rules, partner. What are we, savages? Don't answer that. Seriously, though, what the fellows are doing over at Zorg Industries? Oh, truly works of art. I mean, Michelangelo creaming in his cute little Vatican guard outfit. Well, magnificent. What's that? Oh, Harvey's got it? Yeah, now that might be hard for him to walk off. <laughs> I said hard. Yeah, phrasing indeed, Sterling, right? <laughs> what? Well, what do you expect me to do about it? Haven't I done enough for job at the casting hutch already? Besides, we need to stockpile enough vaccines for the board. I mean, Epstein. You know, that guy had the grace of this see to break his neck in three separate places. Oh, boy, it's lonesome. Father, son, Holy Spirit. That man really missed his calling as an artiste. What I got to do? Draw Harvey a map? What do you mean management cut me off? Hey, I know what management did last summer. Nobody can bring John Lennon and OJ together like me. And that's just my name. Who do you think gave Sterling Archer his charm? Well, I'm not going to lie. I banged his mom. And a lot. Yeah, Sterling, I, I said the wet bar's over there. Help yourself, buddy. Try the armadillo vermouth. It's in season. The Mark Roman Empire. Also, a podcast. This week's episode, John D. Domenico. It's showtime! Episode 27, dated the 8th of April, 2020. Guys, I may have said episode 25 last week it was 26 a thousand pardons for any inconvenience that may have caused you or your family but if this dropped on wednesday and i think it just might we did it back on schedule so how am i sounding Less playing hide the narcoleptic salamander australian rules underwater with aquaman more Hey, how you doing? I mean, if we both wear body condoms, maybe? You're welcome. By the way, if the open felt a little long-winded, my apologies. As I hydrate here, we've been having some issues with the Zoom. You know, we're not the only ones. I know, but I think former acting Navy Secretary Modley... One of the cons uh, consultants hacked into our Zoom. Again, a thousand pardons for any inconvenience that may have caused you or your family. By the way, if you know anyone who needs sound work, my sound guy, Ollie, might be able to help. He was laid off from his main gig due to the pandemic, and apparently they have brought him back for two hours a week. How does that pay the rent? So if you need audio help, Ollie would really appreciate the work. You can find him on his Instagram, Ollie Holiday. That's spelled O-L-L-I-E-H-O-L-L-I-D-A-Y. Look for the puppy. Is it a pug? And the Union Jack. So how'd you like the pandemic check-ins in the last two episodes? Not a bad spread, huh? Well, now we return to the single interview episode format, and we're bringing it back with a bang. That's right, kids. I've got none other than global Donald Trump impression sensation, John D. Domenico. Johnny D. on the pod today. More about that in a minute. If you listen to the podcast, you know my cause is Hero Tear, a word I coined a decade ago. Uh, no new Hero Tears this past week. 
I regret to inform you. Looks like I might need to reach out to some folks. Good news, though. I just heard from Vanka today. She's been in a hotel for the last few days on the last of her dimes. I don't know if I got to mention this, but uh, some charity put her up for a couple weeks. We were do doing the um, Operation Keep Room because we were afraid she was going to lose it after just the first week. That didn't happen. But after the second week, it did. They kicked her out because she has a car. So why would she need housing? Yeah, the car's about to fall apart. Uh, this is what been, her year has been. Most of it's in the car, but sometimes she gets a room and then there's an issue and, you know, she she doesn't have permanent housing. That's why she needs us, the Hero Tears. But the good news is uh, she's got a, a room that she's supposed to move into in a hotel in Oakland tomorrow. And that's thanks to some other local program. But apparently it's going to give them three square meals a day and a once a week laundry. Uh, that's definitely welcome news. I mean, it's only been a year, right? She's hoping, um, apparently this might lead to some permanent housing for Venka, Will, and Andy the dog. She's worked with these folks before, and apparently they almost got something in the past, but not quite. And that's why I say, we shall see. I've been watching how local and state governments have been operating with the homeless, not only up there with the bank, up in, you know, over in San Francisco, down here in L.A. Uh, I'm also watching these charities. Yeah, with their six-figure income uh, um, executive directors. It was a charity that kicked Vink out of a hotel after two weeks because she had a car. Yeah, a car that's about to fall apart. I don't trust governments or charities to look out for the best interests of Vanka. So we're sticking with Vanka until she is in permanent housing that she trusts. And meanwhile, there's a small matter of her needing to pay for her P.O. box, her storage, medicines, and also the absurdly overdue maintenance and repairs on her car. You know, trivial stuff like that. So overall, good news this week. But our work as Hero Tears to bring home Vanka and Will is not finished. You can follow Hero Tear on Instagram at Hero Teargram. And then discover what it's all about at uh, herotear.org. Got a lot of cool new content there. Redid the menus so you can quickly access a lot of the, the uh, frequently visited popular pages. Find out what it's all about. Now, last week, we introduced the Connor Caveat. Uh, we might check in with Connor again next week. This week, we are continuing with family check-ins. This time, from Minnesota, my Aunt Ellen. Let's check in with uh, Ellen for a moment, shall we? Aunt Ellen, or Ellen. I know, I always, it, 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 I always feel weird saying just Ellen. I don't know if that's a comfort thing or a habit thing, but you're my Aunt Ellen. I am your Aunt Ellen, and you're welcome to do either one, whichever works best. <laughs> that is so you, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's introduce you to my audience. Welcome to my uh, podcast here. Uh, glad to have you on for a quick minute, do a little family check-in. I, I did one uh, with my son Connor last week with the Connor caveat. We'll probably bring him back. But mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to check in with you. So um, you're my aunt. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so I am the six years younger sister of your mom. Um, I grew up in New Jersey. Maryland. There are four girls in my family and a brother that lived for only five days that was the oldest of all of us. Oh, that's and, right. Um, so I grew up um, feeling like I could accomplish anything. And, uh, and I, uh, Mark, we may have to start this over again because John is in the kitchen making noises, which I'm sure you can hear. I can, but that's all right. We can keep going. Don't worry about it. Because you know what? Everybody is quarantining right now. This is the new normal. So it's totally cool. We can keep recording. Okay. So we just ran some errands and brought some things into the house. So John is cleaning them off and um, treating nice. them well so we don't bring the virus into the house. And um, Good example for us all. Okay, good. Well, I was embarrassed that there was extra noise going on, but... Life is the way nope. it is, and that's the way it goes. Yes. <laughs> Please don't be that. Um, 
with Trevor Noah has to field questions from audience members asking why, what are those round balls on his shelf behind him in his New York apartment? And is it a sex thing? And he has to like go, no, my mother gave it to me. It's an African thing. How would you even think it's so don't even worry about it. Yes. Hashtag Wonderful. pandemic life. Hashtag quarantine life. <laughs> Proceed. Yes. Okay. So one of the things that I uh, grew up with was feeling like I could do pretty much anything. And um, I hung out with my dad and did things like learn how to use tools in his workshop. Um, nice. We all grew up with a great sense of uh, spatial capabilities. So being able to pack a lot of stuff into a small space, um, pack right. a, a trunk of a car with everybody's luggage to go a ways. Um, some things like that, that I am really appreciating that did not get assigned to, this is what boys do and this is what girls do. Um, so I guess that's just one thing that I would tell you about my growing up. Um, we came in two pairs. So there were two older sisters, Anne and Marilyn, and then there was six years and then with me and my younger sister, Susan. So there right. were four of us and I was in sixth grade. And then there was just two of us. And I got to be the oldest for a while. Um, <laughs> I don't think I treated my sister very well as being the oldest. We have I'll made find it out. Since. Well, I'm going to talk to to Susan at some point here. So we'll, we'll find <laughs> out. We'll try not to stir sure. up too much between you two. <laughs> <laughs> We ended up having a big fight when I was in about ninth grade and she would have been about in sixth grade. And um, yeah. we actually came to blows and I what? was so upset with myself. Yeah, she just, she wouldn't do what I asked her to do. First I told her to do it and then she she wouldn't. And then I asked right. her nicely and she still wouldn't. And so I bopped her one, um, <laughs> but I, I was pretty disturbed by it. And I went off for a long walk. And when I came back, we decided together that uh, we would not do it that way anymore and <laughs> we would figure things out. And we have ever since then. So that worked wow. out okay. Well, I'm so glad we're doing this because <laughs> I never heard that story, was aware of it. This is amazing. Yeah. That's so cool. All kinds of stories. I mean, it's not cool that my Aunt Susan got hit by my Aunt Ellen, but we just, it's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> I would have never known. Yeah. We had to work out other things. I remember when we were littler than that, I was probably maybe 10 and she was seven. And our job after dinner was to um, take the dishes, clear the table for the family and take the dishes and load them into the dishwasher. And right. we would often sing while we were doing that. Right. And we had to work out one thing because sometimes one of us would start one song and then the other one would start a different song. Sure. So we made an agreement that you could join in and you could sing parts, but you couldn't start another song. So that <laughs> agreement has also lasted <laughs> the rest of our lives so far. Are you listening, James Corden? I think you should take some <laughs> notes. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. Well, and, uh, I, I'd like to reference all this as Hodge's lore because this would be uh, my grandfather, um, your uh, father, and also uh, your mother, C. Yep. West and Betty. And mm -hmm. we'll get into a sec, a common question I ask a lot of folks with my here at Tiracaz, but uh, since we're already deep in the Hodge's lore here, uh, is it true that... Uh, Grandpa West and uh, Grandma Betty, they survived both the Great Depression and also World War II? They did. And actually, they were both alive during the uh, flu, the Spanish flu of 18, uh, oh, sorry, wow. 19, right. 18 and 19. Although that was not something that we heard any reference to. We, I checked with my sisters the other day, and neither of us remember mom or dad saying anything about that. Um, dad would have been eight or nine and mom the same. Um, so they, the family, ahead. the family uh, motto has always been no news is good news. So it could have been part of like the, the new England patrician <laughs> inherited English thing of stiff upper lip and, you know, well, we survived it. What's there to talk about type thing or. 
I think there were a lot of things um, that didn't get talked about. I One of the biggest ones that stands out is I mentioned my older brother, whose name was Paul, and I didn't actually even know that I had an older brother until I was yeah. about eight. And my uh, I had, uh, had a kitten that was loose in the backyard and wandered into the next yard and got killed by the bulldog that lived in the back in the next yard. Oh, no. And I was born on vacation while that happened. And I came back to find out that my kitten was dead. And I remember lying in oh. bed that night and crying about it. And sure. my mom coming in and telling me about my brother, Paul, for the first time. And wow. um, so this be I, the between other, you and Marilyn. No, this was oh, the mom and dad's first child, older than Anne, oh, two, year, wow. two years older than Anne. Okay. So, yep. And so, um, you know, one of the things that I've also realized is my, I lived with my mom and I lived with her mom, my grandma, Sherry. And mm -hmm. I remember no stories about my grandpa, Sherry. Nobody talked about him. He died when mm -hmm. my mother was 16 and, um, it made a huge change in their lives. They had to move out of the house that they had lived in all their growing up. Um, financially, it was at, in the time of the depression. It was um, financially, they were very tough off. Uh, my grandmother learned to sell insurance. She also oh, wow. um, changed sewing lessons for the tuition for the uh, day school that uh, my mom and my aunt Esther went to, um, mm -hmm. she did a lot of creative things. Um, but that, but there were no stories about my grandfather. And so this was my mom's father and my grandmother's husband yeah. and nobody talked about him. So wow. there were a lot of things that didn't get talked about in my family for sure. Sounds like something we can delve into perhaps in a, in a future discussion. I, I was curious what, um, what do you think would be uh, grandma and grandpa's take if they were alive today, given um, what they would have lived through? What would be their advice or perspective on uh, the current coronavirus pandemic and dealing? That's a really good question. I think they would be washing their hands lots and uh, doing quarantine stuff and um, probably say, you know, we'll probably get through this. I, I can uh, imagine grandpa, because I always re vividly remember uh, he had that bag or satchel that he would yes. carry uh, on the subway going from, you know, suburban uh, New Jersey and Hackensack, where you guys were. I've been to the house. I, I've, I've seen the house. Yes. Yep. Um, uh, with mom once way back when. So he'd ride the subway into the city for his job. And he had all these cool things and systems. Uh, in that bag. And I can just imagine him pulling his satchel out and, and pointing to, you know, his mask and he'd probably have a backup mask, you know, for himself or for other people that you're might need it. Right. Extra yes, pairs would. of gloves. Like he would, there'd be like a whole, like, you know, military field kit just casually <laughs> included. And, and he would just take for granted that, well, yeah, that's what any normal able-bodied human would do, you know? <laughs> yes. Yes, he also had a little box of sort of mini tools. Um, he was on a work trip once and he had put his briefcase, I think, on the either the front or the back of the car and managed to back up over it. Um, it fell off and he backed up over it and it tore it. And I think he repaired it with dental floss at the time. But he sort of went, OK, I would really like to have a little set of tools with me. Right. So I inherited the box and it's now with Kirsten Lindquist. And there was, you know, a hole punch and there was some dental floss and a, a big needle and I think some um, duct tape and a few other things like that. Probably right. a little screwdriver or two. Um, well, to well just before take MacGyver was even an idea in some TV right. writer's mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes. That's amazing. Now, I know that you're kind of mostly retired now, but what do you do professionally? Or have you been? I'm, a, I'm a licensed psychologist, and I've worked with kids and families and individual adults uh, for 
over 30 years now. Um, so I have a few clients that I'm still seeing and I'm doing some consultation in the field of psychology and uh, doing some teaching, all of which I'm really enjoying. And it's sometimes you have a needy nephew who checks in <laughs> for, uh, for unofficial <laughs> counseling. <laughs> happy, happy to be present as a listener anytime. Well, maybe we'll get more into that in uh, in future uh, episodes if you want to do this type of check-in again in the future. Um, but I saw an article in the LA Times here just a day or two ago, and it wasn't surprising, but I, I kind of want to get your take on it um, since it, it delves into your field. Uh, mm -hmm. Apparently, there has been a spike in calls to the suicide hotlines during mm -hmm. the pandemic. So maybe wow. what, what are your thoughts on that? And also maybe um, what's a little... A little Zen uh, how-to from my my aunt Ellen to take us out here. Well, I think any time that things are really up in the air, uh, it's a lot easier for our fears to get bigger. And if I'm dealing with depression anyway, and I don't have anybody to get hugs from or close to to talk to, and those kinds of things, those are all things that would increase depression. So I can believe that um, that issues that aren't dealt with yet would get bigger and uh, and that people would be thinking about suicide. Um, I'm hoping that they call hotlines and get some help. And uh, I'd be actually um, happy to share. It's a little relaxation meditation, yeah, but that please. it talks about um addressing each part of your brain. So we have we have our survival brain that helps keep us alive. And right. we have our emotional brain that's about connecting to other people. And we have our thinking brain that um, sort of puts it all together and allows us to think and feel at the, at the same time. And sure. if the lower down ones are freaking out, the higher up ones like the thinking brain isn't going to work so well. So if you've got, if we've got a couple minutes, I will talk you through it. And anybody who's listening can try it out also. And maybe it would be a useful piece. I could use a, an Aunt Ellen Zen moment. Let's do it. All right. That would be fun. So what I'm going to invite you to do, Mark, is just uh, sit back in your chair, get into a relaxed position, invite you to have your feet on the floor, not your legs crossed and your hands in some position that feels relaxed without your hands touching each other. And I'm, I'm right holding the microphone, so I feel very relaxed. Okay, <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> terrific. So um, I just invite you to take a breath in and to let it go. Actually, I'm going to back up. When you, uh -oh. sit, as you're sitting right now and thinking... Yeah perhaps about the coronavirus or your life or getting this podcast finished or whatever, um, I'm going to ask you to check in and see um, how big the activation in your body is right now. Well, so, no, what does that mean? What's activation of my body? Activation means how much you're freaking out inside. So 10 is I'm freaking out the most I can possibly imagine. I am right. more terrified than I, I'm the most I, terrified I can imagine. That would be a 10. And down to zero would be, I am absolutely calm and peaceful. There is no tension in me. So to just check and see kind of what number you'd give yourself at this point. I should probably be a six, but I feel like I'm a three right now. Okay. So, so somewhere in there. Okay. And yesterday so, I was a one. So, you know. All right. All right. So yesterday must have been a good day. Sense, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back into that relaxed position and take another breath and let it go. And just be aware of your body. Notice if there are tense parts in it. And especially be aware of your shoulders. And just take another breath and allow your shoulders to relax. Just let them be peaceful. And know that when your shoulders are relaxed, your good. survival brain 
gets the message that you're physically safe. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Getting that message. Yep. Yeah. And as you take another breath in, be aware of your head and your neck and your shoulders and what the level of tension might be there. And allow your forehead to smooth out. Check in with your jaw. Let your jaw muscles relax. That might take some and, doing. <laughs> and with, okay. And with another breath, just allow the corners of your eyes and the corners of your mouth to turn up a little. And as I've you do that. I've never tried to do that before. And I've been yeah. directed to do a lot for TV and film and stage. So okay. can I get that direction again? <laughs> What's that note? So as you allow the corners of your mouth and the corners of your eyes to turn up, you often can notice a change in how it feels inside. And what that does, it tells your emotional brain that emotionally you are safe in this moment. I don't want to freak you out, Ellen, but the minute I turned up the corners of my mouth and my eyes, I could see out of the corner of my eye, it, the sun got brighter outside. Maybe it's my imagination. Oh, cool. That's and wonderful. It's not near today, but yeah, there's a few clouds. Mm -hmm. I think the, something just happened. <laughs> nice. You've got so super, then, superpowers, Aunt Ellen. Absolutely. Absolutely. All across the country from Minnesota. Right. So I'd like to invite you to take in another breath. And as you do, feel the air going through your nose as you breathe in. And feel the air coming out and allow your in-breath and your out-breath as you continue to be the same length. Oh, and this lets you your finger ring. Your, your prefrontal cortex, it allows it to balance right to left, front to back, and top to bottom. And it allows it to be working and allows you to think and feel at the same time. And also, as you do that in-breath and the out-breath and are present with it, it allows you to be in touch with your best self the part of you that can acknowledge what's going on with the other parts of you. So that can say, boy, part of me is feeling really sad or scared or lonely or happy and can just acknowledge those feelings and be present with those parts of you in a, in a good way, as opposed to yelling at myself or beating up on me or any of those things. That was really helpful. Thank you, Alan. You're welcome. So just yeah. check in now and just see where you are on that that one to ten. If if I don't remember which direction we did it last time. If ten is feeling really relaxed, actually we'll do it the other way around. Well, yeah. One is feeling really relaxed. Today and I was a one. Today I'm a three, but I probably should be a six. And now I feel like a one point nine. All right. All right. One point. So this, is, this is something that you can just actually do any time you start getting inside nice. as a way to help yourself. Well, we, we got to run friends. here, but it okay. was so fun checking in with you, Ellen. How would you enjoy this? I do, too. Thanks so much. And if there's we another should... time that we can get together, I'd be happy to do that. I like that. I think we might need to do that. All right. Well, thanks, Aunt Ellen. We'll talk to you soon. Stay safe out there. Wow. Thanks for bringing us that much needed Zen life hack, Aunt Ellen. Well, did that help give you some insight on my Hodges heritage? Maybe we could do a little more of that in future episodes. Also, <laughs> fortunately, I do not need health insurance to talk to my Aunt Ellen. So I've got that going for me. By the way, if you heard some jingly janglies during the first part of the intro, you know, shimmy, bow jangles. Yeah, before my chat with Ellen. Sorry about that. I think I fixed it. Also, a thousand pardons for any inconvenience that may have caused you or your family. 
All right. Now the main event here, kids, kidaroos. What is, is that a thing? Kidaroos? I don't know. So this interview almost did not happen. I actually didn't happen in real life uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, Johnny explains during the interview. That's right. Maybe you heard him as Trump on Howard Stern last week. That's right. John D. Domenico, the man of too many impressions to count. He's been working a successful career of corporate gigs, but he shot to global fame with his Donald Trump impression. And yes, because I know you're wondering, Alec Baldwin has an opinion on John. Let's save that for the interview. Also, I gave you guys a serious Beatle, you know his name, a serious, Jesus, that was like a fucking soliloquy. That was hard on my pipes, kids, that voice. This is why voice actors need union contracts. And wow, you guys got a soliloquy there. I literally woke up in the middle of the night a few days ago and wrote all that crap out on my phone. Yes. Hashtag artist life. Okay. I literally wake up in the middle of the night to give you guys cool shit. You're welcome. That's what I do. Oh, did I mention? Did you even mention this? Got a new tip jar, guys. You can go to markgomanempire.com and click on tip jar. But you can also, if you're listening to this on SoundCloud, I know a lot of you guys do. Thank you. If you're within SoundCloud, there's a new option there, new little button. Where SoundCloud reminds you that, hey, you know, a lot of us creatives out there hit hard financially because of the pandemic, because we can't do live gigs mostly, among other things. So there's also a button there where you can uh, donate, and your tips are definitely appreciated. Keep the pod going. Even a dollar is a big difference. You know, 16 people doing one dollar, that pays for one of my hosting fees. So it's really appreciated. Um, that one goes to my Venmo. Uh, if you need other options other than Venmo, just go to markromanempire.com, click tip jar. But that's I uh, really appreciate, guys, because, uh, you know, I literally harshed my voice here with uh, with Beetle, what have you. And, uh, yeah, so I think you guys are going to be good because this episode, it is bursting at the seams. I don't think you're going to leave this feeling disappointed. It is only the 27th episode. But it just might be the best one yet, if I do say so myself. I'll let you be the judge. And now, here's Johnny. Johnny D. Domenico. Johnny D. We did it. Finally, you're here virtually. I know. It's, this took a while, and I was really looking forward to doing it in person in I Los know. Angeles, sitting I across know. from you, having a cup of coffee or, you know, whatever we would have, chai latte or whatever well, you would have, uh, you know. Well, and that, that would have happened only because you were so kind and generous to invite me to a red carpet uh, along with a, a, a plus one. And we were going to do the uh, in-person interview in your, uh, you know, either at the location or, you know, possibly in your hotel room. Um, during the time you're here in LA, but the pandemic canceled it. So can you share with us what, what was the red carpet for and, and what happened? Well, it, um, so, uh, a few years ago and I've known you for a while. So, but it was, I think it was 2015, 2016. I did the Razzie awards in LA through my good friend, Paul Preston and his, uh, lovely wife, um, uh, Karen Volpe, who has unfortunately, um, passed away recently oh, no. um okay. uh but she was they they're, they're a lovely they will always be a lovely couple but and they're and great um great actors great comedians great musical theater people and um he has a show called the the movie guys and they've always been i've all you, you know me i'm always on the lookouts how can i get a friend employed how can and and they are the oh, same you've been way. wonderful that way absolutely yeah Definitely and they're, the, they're the and they're the same way they always try to um you know we're in a small community 
uh, of performers, even coast to coast. It's actually a small community. A lot of us know each other. And if we don't know each other directly, we know each other through friends. And oh, they absolutely. said they yeah. um, their friend was producing the Razzies that year. And there was talk of a Trump. And they were like, oh, well, we got the perfect Trump. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I came found in. myself saying that same phrase on more than one occasion. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you know, we're always asked to do a lot of stuff for, you know, gratis. And, you know, we have yeah. to weigh the pros and cons, but I ended up doing it for very little money. Uh, the Razzies that year. And I think we were at the United theater in downtown LA, which turned out to be this enormous, you know, 3000 seat old classic theater. It was so much fun. LA comedians, LA performers, sketch comedy people, all these different things. Cause it was a regular award show. Just think well, of the Oscars. Okay, so pretty for impressive for the Razzies. I mean, yeah, that, it was one of those years where everything came together for them. And when you invited me to the Razzies, I got to be honest, I think my my first uh, thought, like everyone's probably is, you know, I'd love to go to an award show, but the Razzies? Like, what, yeah. what are you trying to tell me, John? If you are a comedy, if you <laughs> are a comedy wonder. person, that is the place. That's the place to go. So that year, yeah, you were um, not getting did, an award. You were performing there in high. I was performing. I was yeah, presenting really as clear. Trump. Yeah, I was presenting as <laughs> right. Trump for worst female performance. And I think it was Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, whatever her name of was. Of course. Uh, and um, it was great. I had two Secret Service guys. It was just the nice. whole thing was a blast, and it was. And the night was great. And I got to meet so many other L.A. actors, performers, sketch comedy people, which is really nice. You know, when you do these things, you never know what to expect. Um, and also right. there was a huge international press corps because the press corps, you know, they love the Golden Globes. Obviously, yeah. that's their I was going to say you got kind of a Golden Globes bump there. Sort right. Of. And they they are the same way. They don't care if it's negative about movies or positive about movies. That whole international press corps just loves anything to do with movies. And over right. the years, a lot of stars have shown up at the Razzie. So I did it yeah. and I got an amazing boost for, and which I didn't even know. I wasn't even thinking about it, um, yeah. but I got an amazing boost internationally. Italian TV picked up the Trump thing. Nice. TV, and it was really nice. It was a lot of fun. So anyway, um, so the red carpet I invited you to this year was for um, this year's Razzie, the 40th anniversary of the Razzies. And nice. unfortunately, uh, due to um, the, the coronavirus, as Trump calls right. it, the Kung Flu, the Kung Flu, <laughs> um, it, you know, it got moved because it was part of this year's theater was the Barnes Doll Theater in Las Vegas and the Barnes Doll um, Art Park, which is a park oh, okay. in Los Angeles. It's like a 300 seat theater uh and uh at yeah, a i've never point, been i was looking forward to discovering it you know, literally I've, just down the from me. Been, and i you know i love when you find out about stuff like this like oh my god there's a theater in a park in los right. angeles and right. it's up for rent and it's actually supposedly a very nice theater so well, here's uh, the cool thing about its location it's literally practically across the street uh just near hollywood and vermont almost uh mm -hmm. to the dresden which a lot of people oh my god the famous um, dresden from Sweden. yeah from, yeah, exactly. And then right next door to that is, um, oh crap, I'm forgetting, but uh, it's where uh, Jeff Goldblum and the Mildred Snitzer Orchestra performs their uh, uh -huh. jazz. Uh -huh. um, Jeff Goldblum, and I'm, Jeff, I'm Jeff, upset Jeff I Goldblum. can't mm -hmm. recall. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Jeff what, Goldblum. Uh, <laughs> yeah, tell me more about Jeff Goldblum. Yeah. I can't think what the place is called to save my life right now. I'm so sorry. Guys. Oh, but that's you just named some really key landmarks. In yeah, there. it's right next door. It's a wonderful venue. And I, I went and saw Jeff perform. And he was very lovely. He, he um, stayed quite a while afterwards to get photos with anyone who wanted them. Including I mean, myself. is that guy tall and so. skinny? That uh, guy you know what? Tall? He is. Yeah. Well, as you see in my photo with him, like I'm six foot. Um, I thought he was a lot taller. He's. I think that's just because he's he's pretty lean. Um, he's insanely lean. I saw him. Yeah. I think he just got maybe an inch or two over me. But you know, I it, it was not as much over. as I was expecting. I can't get over it. He had skinny jeans on. He had the skinniest legs I've ever seen. But anyway, <laughs> he's um, Jeff Goldblum. We're, I mean, we're, right here. we're 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 we're. I think we're being Jeff Goldblum right now. We're di we're tangential. So uh, um, so uh, I wanted to uh, invite you to that the penumbra of uh, John Malkovich, perhaps. Yeah, you know, <laughs> who wants to be and, Jeff Goldblum? 
and a couple of um, other people I wanted to invite to the red carpet. And uh, since the theater is part of the city of Los Angeles uh, and connected to the state of California, as these things started rolling out about the coronavirus, certain things yeah. were getting shut down. So they, we lost that theater. Um, and then I think there was another theater at one point and then the production company pulled out because they didn't want to send their team in. And then that Friday, the Friday it would have been, um, uh, that would have happened. I flew into LA. I flew into Burbank. Um, and that was a friend for breakfast. <laughs> I know, I was texting you like, is this still yeah. going on? What's yeah. happening here? <laughs> and I, I had breakfast and then, you know, it was like 10 o'clock or not. It was nine o'clock in LA, 12 noon yeah. and, um, on the East coast. And then, uh, our, our, our fearless leader, President Trump, greatest president <laughs> of the history of presidents, called for the, it was the first time he, you know, said it was a national emergency. And then yeah. the theater we were supposed to be working in that night pulled the plug. And we wow. had already made a contingency. Uh, Mo Murphy, who's one of the producers, and John Wilson, they said, we're going to do this and we're going to shoot it. And, you know, we're going to have remote cameras and you'll come on stage. You'll be by yourself. And we were planning on social distancing and doing it right. And, sure, the show must go and on. And the show must go on. Yeah, you know, because, yeah. you know, we're all operating on a shoestring as performers. And when you lose something like this and you put a lot of time and effort into it, it hurts. Right. So, but then that theater said, no, we're going to... And, and you that invest time. quite a bit. We'll go into that a little more uh, later in the interview here. But yeah. definitely, you invest a lot of your resources into the I theater. do. I do. I do. And unfortunately that didn't happen. So then I turned back around and got on a plane and came home. And, um, since then it's just been, uh, luckily, obviously I haven't worked and, uh, gratefully I have cameo and that's keeping me alive and afloat. Which I want to talk about a little bit later, but sure. hey, we got you on here. I'm so happy. Can we start with, um, how we met in Las Vegas? I'm, I'm sure I recall if it was, I don't think it was Lieutenant Frank. Uh, the character. No, I, do. I, met you out I don't of, think it was Paul Scott's Grand Labs at Downtown Grand, where it was Ed McMahon guy. I want to say it was a, a industry house party, maybe Victor and Alicia's of uh, the. Yeah, band, it was probably band Victor Century. and Alicia's. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I definitely was at those parties, or maybe a SAG after event or something like that. Oh, but Victor yeah, and maybe, Alicia's. Maybe. You know what? It was Victor and Alicia's because I remember you were talking to somebody at the bar. And yeah. I heard you, you were an actor, and I think I introduced myself, and then uh, okay, and, and the rest is history, as we say. Right. Well, and then uh, fast forward, I I uh, I like to joke, you're one of the the many bright spots for me about Las Vegas. Um, I met some really great people, including you know Victor and Alicia, and other people that would frequent their parties, and getting the Beecher's Madhouse gig with uh, Lieutenant Frank, you know, getting to stand in yeah. for Nicholas Cage and hand double for him on the trust. Uh, that was kind of cool. But um, I, I like to joke that my Vegas time was uh, a Saturday that turned into two years. <laughs> when I came back to L.A., you actually, um, we have, we've had a few interactions here in L.A. Someone approached me when I was doing uh, Lieutenant Frank as a busking character on Hollywood Boulevard. I was right in front of the Hard Rock Cafe. And this woman comes up to me and gets right on my face. And she goes, can you do a Donald Trump impression? And I respond, well, yeah, if you got a gun to my head, I'm, I could do a impression. But if you want the impression, your guy is John D. Domenico in Las Vegas. And she goes, I know he's got to go to Asia for some gig. He's not available. So, <laughs> oh, that's right. I know the story you about to tell, tell me that story. Tell, that story. tell us that so story. Um, you had made, you, they had contacted me, but it was one of these things where I, you, this, it, it sound you know, you get people contacting you all the time. And if you don't have their information, you, you don't have it written down, you don't have it readily available. You right. called and that, you know, obviously it, it made a difference. It's, you know, it's Mark. Oh, that you're commercial. I'm not this sure that's the case, but it's kind of interesting. <laughs> well, it just, you know, you, there's a point, you know, there's a point person. It's easy to have a point person. You know how you gotcha. call a casting director's office. Sure. Like, hi, you called me four seconds ago. Who are you? John D. <laughs> mm -hmm. Who did you right. talk to? <laughs> right. I don't know how many people are in the office. Hmm. It's just me. All right. So then I talk to you. Right. Right. <laughs> so I was supposed to shoot a commercial in China as Trump and everything was on <laughs> and, track. And where, where was China, that? China, China, China. 
and everything was on track and it was legit. And we had communications with my agents and they yeah. had booked the tickets and everything seemed legit. And um, there was a one little issue where I had to kiss Obama to do a thing where I was kissing him on the lips. I was like, oh, maybe, I don't know. You know, I could <laughs> Can we That's figure something Obama. out? This is like an Obama impersonator, right? Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. Yes, Thank yes. you for the clarification. So, um, <laughs> so, but everything was set, and I was literally, I woke up at like three in the morning for this flight, or two in the morning, or right. And hashtag was, actor's life. Yeah, and I was about to catch my flight. Bags are by the door, and you know, you always check your email because everything's twenty four hours. Um, yeah. And. It was like jobs canceled. Um, the the you know your ticket's been invalidated. You won't. Be, oh, right. like, what this is an it? international flight. Yes, and I was like, "What is going on?" I, and, yeah, and then the whole thing. And then after that, we couldn't communicate with them. But the fact of the matter was that was that was over. And um, and it was one of these things where I was like, I just went back to bed because I was exa- You know, I only had a couple sure. hours. But when I woke up, I was like, "Holy shit!" I was like, there, I, <laughs> wait, there was, there was something today. There was a movie or, or something right, or, right, and, I, right. and it was one of these things where I'm just trying to piece it together. Wait, let me call Mark. And then <laughs> a phone call. And now this is like nine in the morning or yeah. maybe you might have a better sense of time. For no, that was, yeah, it was like mid morning. Absolutely. Mid morning. And then you were yeah. like, Holy yeah, 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 yeah. Let me be. And you made a phone call and you and made it were, happen. They were you shooting that together. day. Like they were, they were they shooting which was probably that like a 7 a.m. call time. And here it is two hours after the probable call time. It, I mean, this whole thing is crazy. And you're still in Vegas. It's I'm still in, in Los Vegas. Angeles. You're it's still in shooting. Vegas. Still I'm football. assuming they already cast another Trump at of this course. point. Yeah. Um, so I call you, you call the casting director, the casting director calls back. They're like, you were our first choice anyway. We will you know, shoot and kill this other person and dispose of the body. <laughs> exactly. We'll erase their identity. Norma so, would never, ever be so sad of them. They, they booked the flight. They said head right to the airport and my bags were already packed. So all yeah. I had to do was just remove some stuff sure. and I landed in LA. I want to say 12 noon. I was to set by one o'clock. Sounds about right. Um, um, and I was in the makeup chair by 1 32 PM. And I think we actually, even with that, I don't think we started shooting until what? Seven. Eight? It was, I remember being dark as you were kind enough to invite me uh, as a guest on the set to watch it. Yeah. Film. And, and, and um, whose production was this again? It was James Franco's uh, show, um, Making the Scene, where we take he would take two different genres, literally spin a wheel and run them together. So these two genres were a Harry Potter film um, and a classic sex education or something like that. I know I'm off on that second one. Right. Uh, but what they did was they had a lot of that we this mansion in LA where we shot, obviously right. you were there. They've shot a that lot nice of movies. View of downtown too, I remember. It was like yeah. a nice well, that, kind of vintage neighborhood, but you know in this not- massive Victorian house, which I have seen in subsequent movies with an oh, yeah. it, it could easily be actor. if they were doing a production of like the Adams family or the Munsters, it's like or some Halloween creepy, you know, murder mystery. Right. That's it's funny you mentioned that component yeah. because the film with Annette Benning was about a house this woman was living in. She was somewhat eccentric and the house was just falling apart. And that <laughs> house was <laughs> falling apart. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so when they booked my flight in, I don't think you know that you might know this, but when they booked my flight in, they booked my flight out for the next morning at like 6, 7 a.m. But we oh, didn't wow. even finish start. We didn't even finish shooting, I think, oh, until yeah, two, yeah. two or three. Oh, no. So they were getting me out of makeup, and then I got a lift or a car service, sure. and I got to the hotel around 4.30, wow. checked in, slept for 30 minutes. If that. And then went to, yeah, if that, and then just went to the airport because oh, they, wow. they had a room at LAX. But it was, I'll tell you what, like people don't understand how movies are made they how really last don't. minute decisions yeah. are made so people, many moving I, parts I, so much can go so disastrously wrong 
so quickly. Yeah, and people were saying to me when I posted about that, people were like, wait a minute. Wait, wait, they recast it? I'm like, yeah. They yeah. literally delayed production on a James Franco production just so you could be in it. Like, yeah, I don't know how else to so, put it, but that. It was so flattering. That's how good your and, Trump is. That's how in demand it is. That literally a Hollywood production in Los Angeles was delayed so that you could arrive. <laughs> yeah, and he was great. He was so complimentary. And um, he was. It was uh, fascinating to watch him work. Yeah, he's very chill. He's yeah. Very chill. I don't think I actually got to meet him, but uh, you're the other second degree of separation I have with uh, Mr. Franco. Um, Lee Cock is an actor who's in uh, the Clint Eastwood film. Um, crap, I'm forgetting his, his name. The Mule. Um, uh, Lee's got this really hard look, and uh, there's a trailer where he's walking up to uh, the pickup truck that uh, he's oh, is he a cop? the garage. He a cop? No, he's one of the Latino bad guys. Oh, and wow. he's like walking up, looking all rough, and he's got this like AK-47 or some machine gun in his hand. And yeah, so he was uh, my podcast guest on uh, episode number six, and he goes into actually James Franco is his acting mentor. He was just you know raving about you know what a great mentor James was to him. So um, that's great. He yeah. was really great, and you know um, I think it was um, uh, Elvis. Who was the guy? Paris Perez Hilton. Yeah, was there. Perez was there. Um, there was that group of actors. There were a lot of like well-known actors in that group. Yeah, um, Juno Temple, um, mm -hmm. some other people, and it was just very cool to work with him. I was in, you know, I was playing Trump, but I was Trump as Voldemort. So my face was right. <laughs> obscured behind this, you know, this appliance that they had put on my face, which was but, really cool. I wasn't expecting. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I gotta say, from the, the 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 stills on the photos, like your brand of Trumpiness, I think remains intact. So they, yeah, I, I was they able did to a great through. job to honor, yeah. you know, who you are as an artist, um, with you know satisfying the needs of their particular production. So I thought yeah, but it was such a wonderful, positive experience right well thank you again because that was that was definitely a oh thank day. you i mean i was so uh, glad i was able to get that together well you you, you were kind and, and you took care of me in a couple ways that you didn't have to and i wasn't expecting but i i was grateful for that as well so oh. just, you're a mensch of a guy you're now, a mensch. i think the next time was uh you've been involved in a couple trump impersonation contests but there's one at the laugh factory right down the street here in my neighborhood in hollywood that uh, Daryl Hammond put on, and uh, well, no, it was Jamie Matata, the owner of all the Laugh Factories. And oh, Jamie, so, I mean, Jamie yeah, Matata, he yeah, he owns it, it and Daryl Hammond and Paul Rodriguez and a couple of other comedians were the judges, and he had, oh, and, I see. and, okay. and Daryl had come in because he was the judge. He was kind of like the through line. He was the judge on right. ABC's The View, so he came over. Right. And, you know, and, it, and obviously he's, you know, he's the master. So it was great to have him, have him there. And uh, Victor and Alicia, fans of uh, Jimmy Century, they they made the truck out from Vegas. They, I am so Austin. grateful to, for them. They made the truck. I was so honored. They're such good people. I They're, love those they guys. They really are. And they you know, I got to get them on the podcast here soon. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And you know, and I and I've said this at the top, but I, Las Vegas is something I just want to say to your listeners. Um, the people who don't, everybody has their own image of Las Vegas, as we sure. probably do of Los Angeles or of New York. I did before I came there. <laughs> But I, yeah, me too. And uh, yeah. all I have to, have to say is like, this is the most supportive town on the planet. Far more supportive than Los Angeles. You know, you go to an audition, you see a friend there, they're like, what are you doing here? You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm auditioning. Yeah. yeah, and then you yeah. go to New York, and and people, the, you know, people are just so consumed, just trying to pay their rent in New York, especially hey, actors. Right yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but this town, the level of support here in Las Vegas is amazing, and that spills over to you because you brought that to LA, and that got me the benefit of um, being on that on that project. Oh, that's kind of you to say. But no, but I, I I would think you're. I mean, I think it's wonderful, and Victor and Alicia are. Those type of people, they drove to L.A. They drove five hours, 10 right. hours 
to right. see who does that perform like that who does that yeah las vegas people do that because the support is really quite amazing true comment true comment Absolutely. Now, I think the next thing I saw you at was uh, there was a Slate event that you invited me to that you were performing yes. at in downtown L.A. Is that ring a bell? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got a great photo in front of that poster with the giant tie. Yeah, right? <laughs> I got that in heavy rotation. Yeah, and you know what's interesting so about that is we were back at that same, um, I think it was the same theater that we did uh, the Razzies in. Maybe not, but boy, was that a beautiful theater. Oh, oh yeah, right? God. So many beautiful theaters. It's amazing. And now that was not the first interaction you had with Slate. Tell us a little bit no, about no, no. what you've done with Slate. So early on, um, Jacob Weisberg, who was the head political correspondent for the New York Times, he left years ago. He started Slate. And for those of you who are not familiar with Slate, Slate was one of the first online magazines, online right, yeah. publications with all the departments. Before they were it was really, cool. Before it was cool and I think somewhat ahead of their time to a certain yeah, extent. Uh, but there, but most people, if you say Slate.com, they go, yeah, yeah, I know the name. They may not know the content, but they know the name. And mm -hmm. um uh, he, you know, he had started Slate and I think it was around 2015. Um, yeah, it had to be, it was 2015. Uh, and I think it was before uh, or right after Trump announced and he wanted to do a podcast about Trump. He knew he was probably going to make it and, right. um, he was starting to establish himself. So he, created um a podcast called the trump cast oh yeah and he had done a lot he'd written a number of books on on bush and uh, you know, a lot of people i mean this guy was the head political guy for the new york times so he was very savvy and he was very good at spotting political trends and he spotted this whole thing with trump that would most likely happen and it did so he was in the right place at the right time and one of the things he wanted from the beginning Kinda like you yeah. <laughs> more about so that one, later <laughs> yeah but one of the things from the beginning of the process was he knew that trump was reaching a lot of people and had you know the staggering amount of followers. He had influence on, yeah oh he had insane influence is right. and that you know if you're a political if you're at the time underrated by a lot of underrated but but jacob totally understood Right. what he was doing, how he was communicating, how he had condensed his lexicon. He's a politics nerd, and he, like, dived into the data, and he's like, um... Yeah, this, uh, he's, he saw it. He saw here. the reaction, and he was yeah. smart. But one of the things he wanted from the beginning, from the first episode, and he found me, I forget how he found me, he told a story of how he found me, but he goes, I wanted someone to do Trump on the Trump cast to read tweets you know, every few days, because the podcast is only a couple of days a week, three, four days a week, Max. And right. he um, he found me and he thought I had the most authentic kind of accurate Trump voice he had heard. And he contacted That's a me. That's kind of cool endorsement, because it's one thing for the entertainment industry to say that. But for someone who's, you know, um, you know, in the realm of pundits and journalism and politics, for them to have that perspective, that's a completely different thing. And I would, I would think, you know, as a, a deeper level of, uh, you know, authenticity and, and uh, to the quality of your, your impersonation. Is that right, a, right. A and I do them. And over time, we've kind of made them a little more performancey. But, you know, originally, I was trying to do his more authentic. I was trying right. to do the tweets and I was trying to do the tweets the way Trump wrote them. If he was angry, right. I wanted that anger. If he was being sarcastic, yeah. it was that sarcastic, that sarcasm. So that was the whole authenticity, not amplification. Right. And we and the show was one of the first ones out there. Pod Save America came a little later and then just kind of right. got ahead of us. But we yeah. were at one point one of the top five political podcasts. And then we were like the top two. And then Pod Save America right. came on and kind of, you know, kind of <laughs> changed the game. Oh, my God. They pulled everybody's pants down and slapped yeah. their ass. It's kind yeah. of, it was, I was, you know, even I, I listened to what a day no now. Every day. Day. No one saw that coming. Yeah. So, so, but anyway, uh, so, but it's still on 
and it's still uh, part of the slate lineup and I'm still doing the tweets and it's oh, cool. one of these wonderful things that I get to be a part of. Uh, right. And, and uh, there was a funny story because early on when I would send my tweets in, I would record them and then Dropbox them. And I knew right. that the engineers back in Brooklyn would listen to them and then edit the editors with the producer would edit them. So sure. I would just do a rant at the end for them. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> and it was just Fun. for them. It was for their, you know, it wasn't for public consumption, but it was based right, on right. those tweets. And they said, hey, would you mind if we started <laughs> tacking on these rants at the end of the show? Right. And I was right. like, no, not at all. And those rants yeah. have become something very popular, oh, uh, awesome. which is great because it's totally organic. And I love when things happen organically. But I've right? got a lot of followers on Twitter who follow me because of Trump cast. And, you know, they always say, we love the tweets. We love the nice. tweets. And, and, and since you brought it up, how, how do we follow you on Twitter? If we wanted to follow you on Twitter. I am at Johnny D 23. I am verified. You will see a you photo are. of me as Trumpy. You are one of my many verified followers on Twitter, even though I have less than 2000 followers, but you're in the same realm as uh, Dana Carvey. Uh, the L.A. Times at one point, and uh, Tom Cruise, who just let us know today that he uh, that they were recording this, that uh, they delayed uh, Top Gun Maverick to uh, December from this summer, but, you know, not to worry. <laughs> so. how, how, does, uh, how does Trump feel about that, about uh, Tom Cruise Maverick uh, pushing? Well, I'm very excited. You know, I love, love, love the military, Mark. I, I could have been in the military. It probably would be like a general admiral or something. They yeah. would probably combine Were different you, Mr. Things. President? Were you in the military? I feel like... Well, no, were, unfortunately, I had a, a terrible, terrible burn spurs, which oh. uh, miraculously disappeared. Uh, wow. after the Vietnam War. You know what? It's a miracle. And I'm hoping that same miracle Your vice president makes will the coronavirus stay, so. disappear. <laughs> well, I'm sure that uh, there's, there's people like your vice president praying for that, Mr. President. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, back to John. You have a Wikipedia page. Wiki, wiki. Yeah, which I think, uh, I feel like I've got a few other guests who, who've had one. We just haven't necessarily talked about it. But when I, did a little background research, Jenny, because I've just known you, you know, a handful of years since we met in Vegas. And so I don't know your full, you know, story. So I thought maybe we could, uh, you know, touch on a few spots on the Wikipedia page and you can correct whatever might be an error over there. I'm sure you're like everyone who has a Wikipedia page and you absolutely love it because it's so accurate as well, the best, yeah, most so modern accurate. photos. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think one of the problems is it's too accurate. That's oh. kind of the a problem because it, it you know it 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 puts your age out there it puts your yeah. parents names out there just stuff like yeah. that. really i don't that helpful is that, is that needed <laughs> so is it true that you're 29 years old that's right i'm 29 damn it okay good good but you and, know it, it's, it's it's a high honor and 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 i and i pretty much uh, attribute this to being on Conan, being on Red Eye right. on Fox News, um, I, I, it may have been some of the. Now, that's Conan, Conan O'Brien, right? Not yeah, yeah. Me and Conan, Conan, we're buds. You know, I just call. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in California, so we got you know Arnold used to be our our, uh, our governor, and you know he was Conan the Barbarian. So we yeah. got to clarify which Conan. Yeah. No, he's a great um, Conan O'Brien. He's, he's been really Conan O'Brien has been really helpful, and uh, early on, uh, his nice. his team contacted me and then we would do call-ins i would call into the show as trump and i would right. be on the line with him during rehearsals and obviously during the show and he would say wow your your trump is uncanny and i would say well <laughs> your conan o'brien is pretty amazing so <laughs> so, so every time people person. hear trump's voice for the most part in various skits and sketches on uh, conan's show that's you yeah, and we I've made 50 appearances, some of them nice. live and some of them voiceover, but we did these Trump-Obama phone calls that were a massive hit. <laughs> I think I remember a couple of them. They were a massive hit, yeah. <laughs> right. And um, his writers are amazing. Uh, he's got a great team over there. He's had people with him from the time he was in New York. So he's a very loyal person and he takes care of his people 
And um, a number of years, they brought me down to San Diego for Comic-Con. And I would just be there kind of on call when there was an open oh, spot. Right. Yeah. They had so many guests. And if someone dropped out, they needed a, a bit. So sure. I was on standby to be Captain Make America Great Again. And I got to do <laughs> three or four appearances as Captain Make America Great Again, which was, you know, which was awesome. The but I also got coming to my mind yeah. of you in that costume. I think there was like a helmet yeah. involved. Yeah, a little fat guy walking around. And um like a cross they, between a bad uh um elbows impersonator evil Knievel, and i don't know and captain else. america yeah you know? <laughs> and uh but it was so cool because i got to meet like nick kroll and oh, the nice. cast of games of thrones and wow. um, uh who are, there was it was amazing during that week the level of talent the level of talent obviously on any show like that but the volume of people was insane because they would have the entire cast of a movie the entire cast of a tv show the entire and it was just wow it was so cool just so cool show business can be just magical so many times it's wonderful it can, it can. It's, it. it's heartbreaking and magical at the same time speaking of heartbreaking you know New York can be heartbreaking. It's kind of heartbreaking right now what's going on. Yeah, There's a lot of great sad. people fighting the good fight there. And you got kind of a New York vibe about you, but you, you're actually from Ambler, Pennsylvania. Right. If the Wikipedia is, page is correct. It, it is. I'm from right outside of um, Philadelphia, like literally like, right, oh, okay. right outside. And um, my family... Um, my grandfather came from Italy in 1908, ended up in Rochester, New York, and had spent time in New York. All the D. Dominicos were in New York. So we're I didn't see that coming. D. Domenico. I felt like maybe you had an Asian influence there. <laughs> Bernstein and yeah, um, yeah. they changed their name to D Domenico. So um, <laughs> my, my grandfather's brothers went West to California oh, and wow, um, okay. our, um, one of his brothers created what's called rice and and um, never heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, neither. <laughs> we never heard of the part of it. Yeah. So um, he, his family did that. And the D. Domenico family is still pretty well known in San Francisco. Wow. And, I um, had no idea because I used to be yeah, up, and, up north back in the day. Yeah. If you go to the if you go to Napa and ride the wine train, that's owned by D. Domenico. So there's still a lot of. Oh, wow. Of Who and. Um, yeah, so there's D. Domenico's in New York, California, and then my grandfather, what he said was, and this was the family lore, he didn't like how cold it was in Rochester, because Rochester's brutal. I've been I there. believe you. <laughs> and he wanted something more tropical. Okay. So he went way like south, thing. way south to Philadelphia, where it's just so <laughs> warm and sunny. And I'm like, thinking, like, yeah, I was like, Philly, really? Philadelphia? You couldn't uh, have gone like right. South Carolina, Georgia. Baby but steps, I, Johnny. Baby steps. So he ended up in Philadelphia, and we were born and raised in Philly. And okay. um, I always wanted to be an actor from the time I was five years old. And I was really, I was fully aware of the fact that New York was literally up the street. Like yeah, right yeah. up the road, like 90 minutes. And Philadelphia stood in the shadow of New York because um hmm. New York is, and and people always, and I mean this not in a pejorative way, but New Philadelphia is a loser city. And what I mean by that, I want that real clear. (laughs) What it means is, is at one time it was the capital of the U.S. political capital, and they lost that to Washington D.C. At one point, the capital of finance, they lost that to New York. It was once. Mm capital of fashion it went all these things it lost a lot of stuff it's one of the reasons that stallone made rocky in philadelphia because that city is about it's 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 a loser city and i don't mean that like the way it's 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 kind of where it's it's got a chip on its shoulder and that's why it's always right okay that makes sense at one point it was it it was the city um New York was a dump. It was a dump. It was a hellhole. <laughs> but Philadelphia was the sophisticated place that where all of the great minds came to, uh, all of the political 
all the politicians were at, all of the world leaders came to, and it, you know, it, that's kind of that, that's the thing. So anyway, I've always, I've always realized that being in Philadelphia, it's tough. It's got its own music scene, its own theater scene and everything. But, you yeah. know, for an actor, it's really, you've got to be in New York. Yeah. You've yeah. got to be in New York. You don't have a choice. Yeah. So for me, it was always New York, New York, New York. I want to get to New York. And even in like the, when I was in high school and our, the drama guild would go to New York to see Broadway shows. I was trying to learn all about New York and oh, who, wow. what's going on in New York and who's, yeah. who's who in New York. And I kept hearing this name, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump. <laughs> oh, wow. So that, well, of course. Yeah. Cause he was. A yeah. Mystery. So that's I started right. following Donald Trump back in the eighties because he goes like, back that back. That, oh oh yeah, yeah. 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 So I could, you know, I got news stories on him because I would get the New York Times times when I could. And then we also so little got, did you know, you're studying for this. The I had no idea. I just thought he was a map. fascinating guy. I always just thought yeah. he was a fascinating, wow. fascinating guy. I've always loved business and business yeah. in theater yes. and business in movies. I find yeah. like movies like Network and Death of a right. Sales and, and all of these right. things about business are yeah. fascinating. You know, they even really something are. new, um, uh, the, the, the one about, um, uh, God, the, the, the film about the whole debacle, uh, uh, that came up. I find business stories very, very fascinating, but anyway, the debacle. um, so the, the housing, the housing mess, there's a fil- great the big film. short, the big short's great, but there's another one that has a much more narrative structure with, um, Jeremy Irons and, oh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Moore and, I know what you're talking yeah, about. I can't yeah. Yeah. But those yeah. films I find fascinating. Yeah. So, um, but I knew I had to get to New York. I had to get to New York. I had to get to New York and I had a plan to get there and I graduated high school and then I went to college and, you know, I would go to New York. My brother lived in Long Island in New York. So I would visit him on oh, Christmas okay. break yeah. and then I would go into the city and then I had a lot of friends when I was at college who were New Yorkers. So it was always like a New York kind of kind of thing. So that's why a lot of people were under the impression I'm I'm from New York. And and I moved from Las right. Vegas essentially from New York by, you know, I, so I was doing a lot of work there and a lot of off Broadway and off off Broadway and off 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 Broadway. <laughs> so, so off Broadway you, it was you had a madman phase though. I, I got a be a background actor in a couple episodes of Mad Men, but you were actually, if if again Wikipedia is correct, tell us about your Mad Men phase. Oh, so I was um well, my plan to get to New York. I I come from nothing. My dad had a ninth grade education. Um, uh, we grew up in a row home. He's and smarter than my dad, and my dad has a bachelor's degree. <laughs> So, um, so I knew that if I were to go to New York or anywhere, I would need, I need money. We didn't have, we had nothing. I mean, when I say we had nothing, we had nothing. Yeah. And, um, so I, I loved words and I was writing from the time I was in high school and my plan was very simple. I would start at a Philadelphia ad agency as a copywriter. And the way I got my job at this ad agency was I wrote my resume in crayon. <laughs> Brilliant. And I did it's it in panels. I did it in panels. And uh, yeah, yeah, just, you know, but I did it in, as, as opposed to printing it out, I did it in sure. like eight different panels in crayon. I'm not Genius. an artist by any means, but the cr- the creative director at that agency it was called group two really yeah. thought that was great. And I got hired. Yeah. And my idea oh, was wow. I'm going to build my book my copywriting book. Right. I'm going to build it up. I'm going to get that for a second for people who aren't familiar with the industry. All right. So every time in, in, in advertising uh, as a copywriter or any kind of somebody inside an ad agency, your book is your book of work. It's your resume for actors, but in, in advertising, it's your book. So I was going to build my book and then take my book to New York. It's not a book book. It's basically, you just flip through your stuff. It's, it's a, it's basically a hard PowerPoint presentation of right. all of your work and then yeah. how you source your work and you put it together. And I worked there less than like a, a year. Like a coffee table book that's effectively yeah, a visual representation. Yeah, leather bag and you show them. all your work um, and all your concepts. And then you show them spec work, you know, like here's what mm-hmm. I was thinking. Right. And um, I 
really did not like it. Not that I didn't, you know, cause you're thinking yeah. like bewitched and you know, 30 something, yeah. you think of advertising yeah. in that way. Advertising yeah. is an absolute grind, which you actually <laughs> would, you would see that a little more in Mad Men. They would show you the grind mm -hmm. element of it when you're trying to come up with ideas. And this yeah. isn't like sun kissed and, you know, minute made. This is like products. You want to blow your brains out. And, um, I Sounds also like the years in the mortgage business. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you're kind of, it kind of zaps your love for, for it. And, um, sure. and one of the things was I, I found, and you know, life is you, you, you build your life and you know, everything you know is built on everything you don't know. So what Ooh. you don't know is the Explain. thing you go on. To, well, because, okay. Well, you, you learn about, well, you can talk about the coronavirus. Everything I know about the coronavirus is one, two, three, four, six, nine, and ten. And that's what you know. Right. But what you don't know is this. And that is in life too. That's about relationships. Sure. That's sure. about yourself. So as you're moving through life, you build everything in your life on what you know, but what you, but what you don't know is what's going to get you. The missing pieces. It's the missing pieces. It's the underneath. It's, you know, meeting somebody and thinking like, this is a great guy. He's so helpful. <laughs> He's so great. And then somebody says, oh, by the way, that guy is a total scumbag and he's right, going to steal right. all your money. That right. is, you know, that's, that's life. Everything you know is built sure. on everything you don't know. So um, <clears throat> I still loved doing it. I just didn't like working nine to five. I found that my hours are different than most people. I'm actually you, creative super early in the morning. Yeah. And then I have different creative spurts. And I was also, um, joined a, a comedy troupe, a schizoid comedy troupe. Right. And I actually switched agencies, went to another agency because I needed income, but schizoid, mm -hmm. I in very short period of time became the head writer for and because I'm a business nice. person, I started focusing more on getting bookings and we were able to get That's some right. bigger club bookings. Daddy's got to get paid. Daddy's got to get paid. But sometimes, you know, actors want to perform. They don't always create their own opportunities. I'm so, so I guilty made, of that. <laughs> yeah. So I made a point to go out and get us work and pitch people who've never done like restaurants that have never had any kind of comedy on a sketch show. And speaking of restaurants, uh, you actually got a pretty popular gig that is known at restaurants. Yeah, a particular well, type um, of restaurant. Yeah, I was um, I was working in Atlantic City. I was there for a couple of years doing characters and things like that. And I knew I had heard about Tony and Tina's wedding, right? A couple of years before. Now you have to. This is nineteen eighty eight. So this is before anyone really knew this concept. Right. But I had been doing murder mysteries and doing a lot of interactive comedy already. I had a lot oh, I had wow. years of experience okay. right. of it already. It was not foreign to me. I totally knew what it was. It was walking up to tables in character and right. being funny and, and moving right. a story along. Uh, so to me, it wasn't foreign. And I went to the audition. Tony and Tina's wedding was a smash hit in New York. Right. And I, it was like, it was on the cover of like the New York post. I mean, it was, oh, yeah. no, there was nothing else. Like it was the first environmental show. It was the first really interactive show on this scale. And they were, it's they like were going to have Man group or the Cirque du Soleil. The no, day. it's nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they, they did, they, they did something really, really amazing in that the show opens at a church and you're at the wedding, and then you leave the church, walk around the corner, and then go to Vinnie Black's um, Coliseum for dinner. And it, it's really just, it was so innovative. It was so innovative and so different. So now they were going to expand it to Philadelphia with a Philadelphia oh, wow. producer. Okay. And uh, with the original creators, it was, you know, it was going to be the first spinoff from New York. And nice. I heard through a bunch of my friends who knew this type of work, because this was not for stage actors. You could, I mean, and I don't, I mean, there definitely could be stage actors who could do this, but a lot of yeah. stage actors do not want to interact with the audience. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. A lot of work. 
it's right. a lot of work. And you, yeah. it, so this very core group of people I already knew auditioned and most of us, um, I'd say mm, maybe, maybe less than half of the cast was out of Philadelphia. The rest was out of, out of New York and they were just going to move down here. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky. I mean, they had days of auditions, days. Wow. And um, I can imagine I, it's a popular thing and they're looking oh, for the best of the best. So. Huge. I mean, it was just yeah. like, like you said, it was like, you know, the blue man group coming to Philly, or certain Philly and those yeah. people with that skill set being able to do it. <clears throat> so I, I got the part of Joey Vitale, uh, <laughs> Tina's gay brother. <laughs> and I got it. And later on, I found out that the director didn't necessarily want me. <laughs> oh, really? No, he didn't want me. And wow. um, Nancy Cassaro, who was the group that created the show, was called uh, Artificial Intelligence. And gotcha. Nancy was Tina originally in New York City. And this thing had become a juggernaut, and they they became more of a creative force, and were putting Not out to the shows just to let people know, I dropped my earbud guys out of my right ear, so that's why I had a little 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 incident there. The well, hazard of recording at home. <laughs> you were and, saying, um, John? Sorry. Yeah. So as it turns out, um, she fought for me, and. She got me that job, and that job cool. became the high school of my professional career. Okay, and that makes sense. As it formed so many parts of my life, I have friends to this day because of that show. I mean, close personal friends. Right. A post somebody has messaged me from the original cast from you know 1989 because by the time we got everything up and running, it was 1989. The show. Show there are not big hit shows in Philadelphia that happen organically, and the reason I say organically is the fact that we had Philadelphia actors and a Philadelphia producer. Obviously, the show had come out of New York, but oh, it was cool. our show. It was our take on it. So right. um, it ran for over a year, and then we moved to Atlantic City to Trump Plaza. Oh wow! Hello. <laughs> So now I get to meet Donald Trump again because I'm working in his hotel and we do three wow. months there and uh, we wanted to unionize. And then the producer would rather slit his own throat than go union. And he did. He closed the show. That sounds familiar. Yeah. And so just to let everyone know, you are currently a member of which union? I'm a uh, SAG and after. Well, SAG after. It's the same. Yeah. Thing, yes. As am yeah. I. And the Welders Union too, because you know, <laughs> no one Are handles you really? a, no one handles a settling torch like me. Uh, no, my <laughs> my dad, my I don't dad. Know was, I believe you or not, you're from Philly, so it's like oh. no, no, my no, my dad was a welder. My dad was welder. Oh wow, okay. Yeah, he was a he was a machinist and a mechanic and a welder. Um, uh, For, so I've always been fascinated. Some reason. With, it feels so Philly. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It's very Philly. It's a very iron worker kind of town. It's a very, it's a very blue. I mean, there's always the yeah. Philadelphia attorney thing, but it's a blue collar town. Yeah, don't, yeah. don't let anybody tell you different. That is a blue collar, hardworking town. You know what I mean? A lot, of, we, a lot of plumbers. Before we jump into some uh, blue collar stuff, people might know that you've done uh, acting wise. Uh, Weren't you also in uh, the improv troupe? I think it was an improv troupe, Some Assembly yeah. Required. Yes, and I was um, Tom Shalou, who some may or may not know. He's on Fox it's a great right now. Name. <laughs> yeah, Tom Shalou has been around. A really well-known stand-up comedian. Um, he and I became. We were cast in the same off-Broadway show together in like 1990. Hmm. Um, post. Tony and Tina's wedding. I was working, uh -huh. I was starting to work more and more in New York city. And he and I were um, in the same show. And in that cast, by the way, was Julie Bowen who went on to do modern family. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. She oh, was wow. awesome. She was, she was very talented, very driven even back then, like insanely driven. And, um, I can see that. Uh, I matter, really, I, you could, you could just yeah, tell. Um, from, from you could, yeah. Work. She really, that's that she's not acting on modern family. Let me tell you. 
Um, yeah, she, she, she's but we did that show together on Broadway. Yeah, totally. And Tom and I became really good friends. We stayed friends. He was doing a stand up career. I was doing stand up in the mid 90s. Um, he said, you know, you should try out for some assembly required. And at that mm -hmm. time, there were some really amazing improv groups in New York. And um, we were, we, I got, I auditioned and um, became a member. And what they did in that group, um, Molly Brown ran it. And she was pretty amazing. We had weekly long form and short form rehearsals. And then we had weekly shows, but everybody in the wow. cast had to do something. You had to be, you do sales and you would take three month terms. So hmm. they would team up people and people would do sales. People mm -hmm. would do marketing. People would do print. People would do logistics. People would do, and it was great. It was very well run. It was, right. you know, cause we all just want to walk it. I just want to perform. <laughs> right. and, of course. You know, that's not how life is. Life is an life, artiste. Life, yeah. I'm an artiste, damn it. But she really, it that's was like day. a commune. It was a comedy commune in that respect. And it, I learned so much and i just come off this that's so you know, cool. the year period of tony and tina's wedding now i'm focused in new york and i'm in this amazing improv company and i'm working at um a place called mama leone's in new york city where i did walk around as characters so it was right in broad it was right in the broadway um theater district so well-known stars would come in i would have get to see them and i literally walked up to a table and would do in character work. So um, I continue to do that improv kind of stuff. Speaking of Tony, I hear you had a run in with uh, the Tony Soprano. Oh, yeah, I did. Uh, I did. You know, it was so amazing. It was near the end of the run of the Sopranos. Um, and this was an episode called Heidi and Kennedy. And if people remember, um, it was it, what, the, what, the, what stands out about this episode was. Tony kills Christopher. He kills, mm -hmm. he kills Christopher. And mm -hmm. um, it was an amazing week on this show. And I and the woman who played my wife, I was Howie Reinstein. I played I have to Julie. go back and watch that episode because I didn't realize it was yeah. at the time. Well, I didn't know you. So yeah, and um I was Howie Reinstein. It's so funny. I've been trying to get cast on that show as an Italian for years. And for some right. reason, I could not get cast. And I was Howie yeah. Reinstein. I was cast as a Jewish guy, which I was also cast in an off-Broadway show as a Jewish guy. Uh -huh. So I thought it was very funny. But the casting director said, you're just not Jew, uh, not, just not Italian enough. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? Wow. So, yeah. So I don't, uh, I just don't appear... Italian. I think it's your name, Johnny. Maybe you could change yeah, my name. name. Uh, you know. So I got this role as Howie Reinstein. And the, the important thing about this role was I am Christopher's new neighbor. So in this episode, they are basically setting up the Christopher's pulling away from the life in the mafia, but he's really pulling away from Tony and Carmela. He's right. moved to the house and like, you know, this really nice section of North Jersey. I am his neighbor. And so was this other actress who played my wife. And then there were two uh -huh. other actors uh, who were his other neighbors on the other side. And um, that couple was, he was a white guy and she was uh, Indian. And then, um, then the other couple in the scenes that we did was his publicist because he was doing something with music. So Tony, so we would be having a barbecue together and Tony would show up uninvited. Yeah. yeah. And then Tony was like, what the fuck is this? And then, we were <laughs> having dinner one night, and then Tony showed up again with Carmela and was like, what is this? Uh -huh. What are these people you're associating with? Right. And it, there were like four incidences where we were doing things with uh, Michael Imperioli's character and his, uh -huh. the woman who played his wife at the time and had the baby. And the basic, the, the premise was he wanted a normal life. He didn't sure. want to go through. He had lost his girlfriend as, as an FBI informant. He, he wanted was, out. You know, he wanted out. Yeah. So that was the setup to the car accident. Mm. And Tony just says, you know what? I can't risk this. I'm losing this guy. Yeah. And kills him. Lee's but Canada. in the episode, they cut the entire 
subplot, which I was a part of, and so were these other actors. And they boiled it down to Tony gets out of the car, Christopher's bleeding, having trouble breathing, and he looks in the back seat, and you see the baby seat, and Christopher thinks, oh, he's using again. This guy can't be trusted. Not because of the other stuff, because you're never yeah, going to see yeah. that. He's going to endanger his own children's lives, and he kills so, him for that reason. So wait, so your part with, didn't air? It's not on the episode? No, basically I'm a glorified extra because you never see any of those scenes that oh, we show man. except at the funeral. And here is the here is the coolest part about this. It was, you know, the death. Is it the in the DVD? Is, Can you see it in the like uh, deleted scenes? No, the they DVD, don't they know? didn't add back those scenes. But oh, here's the, the cool part. You'll appreciate <laughs> it. Just a second. I'm credited and I get checks to this day. And that was 2000. Nice. Um, in there is a funeral scene and you can see me in the background with a woman who plays my wife, this funeral scene, we had no idea about, cause any, we never were sent a script. Anytime we wanted to see the script, they just held yeah. it up in front of her face. So we get called to silver cup studios, you know, 5.00 AM call. I got to get there like 4.00 AM, leave my right. house 2.30. So we get there and, you know, get into wardrobe and there's the people that I've worked with that week and we're baffled. I mean, we're baffled. Like, why are we here? <laughs> why are we at this funeral? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Everybody's there. Everybody from every preceding season is wow. there. Wow. You're like, this is big. Big plot turn. Like, What's going to happen? I'm like, I didn't even think of that. I, that wasn't even my thought. My thought oh, was like, really? oh, cool. Everybody's here. And there's downtime. So I got to talk to people. Right. And, you know, and I walked over into the, the, to the Vesuvio set that was there. It could and have I been could, a funeral for a non-key character. Just you know, there's a just. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't really put it together because there was yeah, already yeah. a body. There was already a body double in the casket, which I didn't even like. Bodies tended to pile up on that show, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. funerals were commonplace. Yeah. So it, a couple of hours passed by, and um, and uh, they're like a team to the set, a team to the set, and. You know, there's Tony and Silvio and everybody. And then they they were like, uh, the eight, the first assistant director says, get him out and get, you know, get him in here. So this guy gets out of the casket. I'm thinking, oh, all okay, right, that's definitely not him. Yeah. Then Michael Imperioli walks on set and he gets on the little sets of stairs and he gets in the casket and you wow. could have heard a pin drop. Right. All the that time. That was such a huge show. It still is. It was, like, it was enormous. Yeah. And the fact that he was dead as one of the lead characters, right. honestly, you, there was no, the oxygen had been sucked out of the room. And I remember the woman who played Johnny, Johnny Sachs, mm. Johnny Sachs wife. Mm. I remember her going. <gasps> <laughs> Classic. So, um, so that was that the coolest part. Um, I know we're way over on time, but, um, uh, the no, coolest part of that day. Take as long as you want, brother. If we got to split this up into two parts. Uh, yeah. The one coolest thing part of that day to, was. These are amazing were, stories. Thank you, sir. Oh, yeah. So the, the, the coolest part of that day was um, there was a lot of downtime. That was a 17, 18. That was a long, that was a long day. But there wow. was a guy on set. The set had cleared. It was lunch. And I, you know, there wasn't a lot. Of, it was a tight set. Silver Cup Studios always has something going on. But I came back to the set and I was sitting next to this guy and I started talking to him. And it was a bald guy, really nice, very, yeah. very, very nice guy, and easy to talk to. And um, I said something, and he said something, and I, I said, uh, "How do you know, know so much about the show?" And he said, "Oh no, I'm the writer." Oh, and I said, "I said David Chase, right? You were the writer." And he goes, "Yeah." And I said, "I thought David Chase was the writer." He goes, "No, David hasn't written a word in two years." He goes, "He'll consult, but he really hasn't written anything." Oh. And I said, "Oh," and I said, "Who are you?" He goes, "I'm Matthew Weiner." And I go, "Hi, nice to meet you." And no um, way, the guy who yeah. created Batman. Oh wait, it gets better. <laughs> wow. So he's sitting there, and we're talking. And I said, I said, I'm no, I'm not blowing smoke. I said, this is the greatest television show that's ever been on. I mean, it's really amazing. Yeah. And I said, I, I said, it's unique. And I said, I don't understand why it's so 
good. Right. Oh, it had, there's something about it. And he said, yeah. well, here's why. He goes, we don't shoot this episodically. And I said, huh? huh? He said, we shoot this as one massive 12 hour movie. Okay. Gotcha. And I said, oh. Yeah. Yeah. He said, do you, do you guys remember last year when we did, we were two months late coming on. We were supposed to be on in January and we weren't even on until late February. And I said, yeah. And he goes, David will not air a single episode until we've cut all the episodes. Wow. That's impressive. Oh, I, it's, and, and he you can see it in the work and how it stands yeah. the test of time. So, so what happened was they had That's been on awesome. a big break at this point. I mean, they'd almost been off the air for like a year, but he was explaining to me, David is he's, this show is different and he wants it, you know, done a different way and all these kind of things. And this, they had already been on break. I mean, we were coming back and right. this episode I was told at the time wouldn't even air for like another nine months. Wow. But he had mentioned about he'd been gone. He'd been working on another show. And and I was like, what's that about? He goes, it's about advertising in the 60s. <laughs> and I mean, I had not, I mean, you know, one went in one ear and out the other until sure. I watched the first episode of Mad Men. I'm like, right. oh my God, this guy told me about this years ago. <laughs> years ago. And yeah. a lot of people don't know about, not to get off my own story, but. Um, well, this is about your story. So it's, but no, no, no. But what, what the thing about Matthew Weiner is that story was, here's a guy who was on the, this is a showbiz story in the sense that here's a guy who was a writer on the single biggest television show, considered one of right. the best TV shows ever. Yeah. Ever to this day. Yeah. When he pitched the Godfather Mad TV Men, shows. When he pitched Mad Men. To HBO, they didn't want it. <laughs> of course. Of course. They didn't see it oh, and they didn't get wow. it. And that's the thing. Like everybody thinks yeah. about, oh, once I get to this point in my career, things are going to be easier. Or once I get to this, or once no. I do a feature film, it never gets easier. No, it, it never gets easier. <laughs> and we fought tooth and nail and he ended up nobody wanted that show nobody right, right. Right. ended up on amc it was their first scripted narratively scripted right. show and they retooled of, themselves to accommodate essentially is a, a way of looking yeah. at it and and for that show to get on air they had to cut and he basically cut his income his salary so he could get the detail period piece stuff so anyway Makes it was sense. to wrap that part up it they was an amazing. Particular. What's that? I remember a couple episodes I was on just as background, but you just you could see oh, the level of so you know detailed. intricate attention to detail, you know, from the, the costumes to the set design. Oh, the type, um, supposedly the typewriters. If you had a, it was a if it was a nineteen sixty two episode and they had a nineteen sixty four Selectric, he would be like, I don't want to. It's got to be a sixty two. I was like, uh, oh, yeah. Would say, no one is going to know the difference. He's like, I'll know the difference. Right, exactly. And the same with the wardrobe. It was amazing. So it's like, yeah, it was a great experience just to yeah. see. And you could feel the vibe of it too, the authenticity and just people drilling oh, down. And each I, of those I, 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 as, just and, and as, yeah, and as good yeah. as Sopranos was, I think that shows better in that it really shows the duality of man, what oh, men wow. are about. It really, it really captures that. Down to the fact that he assumed another guy's identity, and he basically yeah. was, right. and That's you right. saw, and you saw that he was two people from the first episode. He was married with a family in Scarsdale, yeah. but he's sleeping with the bohemian artist in right. um, the East Village in Greenwich right. Village. So anyway, but that was a really great experience. I love being on the show. It was a disappointment that I was cut out, but I think every actor I know has been cut out. Well, absolutely. Yeah. I was, uh, you know, in my little tiny, early, you know, fledgling career, uh, my Lieutenant Frank character was actually hired um, off the street by uh, a location crew for the show um, uh, Ray Donovan on Showtime. Wow. Yeah. and. Uh, I literally, my character got to interact with Lee Schreiber, the, the main character, um, for my scene. And I didn't have any lines, but like I was, you know, I was being Lieutenant Frank, short shorts, rainbow tactical leg warmers, you know, the banana, the, the mustache, the Barbie walkie, the whole deal. 
And apparently, uh, Leave just kept cracking up because of my character. So they, you know, cut, <laughs> take, do another take. They ultimately cut it from the episode, which when you watch the episode and you see the through line of the plot, there's no way in hell my Lieutenant Frank character could exist in that plot line because it would be so distracting right, from exactly. the fast pace of what was going on. So I totally get why it ended on the, the cutting room floor. And, and I'm grateful because it's like, you know, it's a great masterpiece, Ray Donovan. But yeah, that's show business. That can happen. Yeah. It's hap- hey, but listen. Happen you were also in True Detective. Right. What's that? You were also in True Detective, another iconic show. No, no, no. Oh, that was the original True Detective on CBS, and I had a role, and that was never cut. It wasn't the oh, new really? One. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, and this was, you know, it was when the whole reality, you know, the whole uh, reenactment boom was happening mm. in the early '90s. It was about a, a guy okay. who worked at a bank who stole some money from the bank. And, well, yeah. let's let's pivot because there's so much cool stuff to talk about in your career. Let's talk about yeah. your, you were uh, nominated for an Emmy for some commercial work you did, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did a commercial in the Boston, not the restaurant Boston market, but in the actual Boston <laughs> market. And um, it was a commercial where I did six characters. I did Trump and Ozzy and Guy Fieri and Dr. Phil. And I was for a new cellular phone company. Ozzy. Was be starting to yeah, Ozzy Osbourne. Oh, oh wow. I was, Aaron! I was getting home, man. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So I did a oh, bunch God, of characters in that. And um, and it it got out there and it got nominated, and uh, the guy, the producer who lives in Connecticut, um, he said to me, "Hey, do you want to?" He goes, I- "I'm going to go," and I said, "Do you want to go?" And I said, "Hell yeah!" And um, I ended up going to Boston with him and his girlfriend, and it was an amazing night. And that night was amazing because the guy who was Big Bird. Mm-hmm. was was from there so he was getting a lifetime um uh, Big Bird on a lifetime yeah okay and he told his story i, I mean i cried my eye I, I mean i was not expecting that i didn't know what to expect wow. from you know it was an award yeah show. he just passed away recently didn't he and he just passed away and i have to tell you something i am so grateful i got to see him speak Wow. So grateful. And he brought me to tears that night and really made me feel, you know, you know, here's a guy who was an actor, a puppeteer, and ended up becoming yeah. this iconic character. And then he himself became, you know, uh, very well known because of his charitable work and things like that. Amazing. So, um, so that night, um, we get the program for all the categories. And I think we were up for best commercial. And then I, I- looked. I look at the nominees and there's only three commercials in the category us and two Boston Red Sox commercials. And I'm thinking, well, wow. can I get, is the bar still open? Cause I'd like to get another drink because we ain't going to win against the Boston Red Sox. And I don't know right. that. Right. Two. I mean, we would have yeah. had to split the atom to win this Emmy Double and uh, shock in there. Yeah. So, uh, so I was proud to be nominated. I have all the paperwork from the, um, Emmy, Acad- what is it? The, um, what's it called? Not the Academy, uh, whatever it is, arts and sciences. So that was very nice. It was a lovely evening and it's something that I can say, and it's, you know, it's legit. I have an Emmy nomination. <laughs> yeah. It's an honor just to have been nominated. <laughs> it really is. It really is. When you get that paperwork, you're like, wow, this is really cool. Not this everybody can say that. Not everybody yeah. is a, a nominee by the Emmys. Now, what brought you to Las Vegas? Um, so I had a book. I'm on the road about 35 weeks a year. Yeah, you uh, are. Not this year. Well, <laughs> in between <laughs> pandemics, as I like to say now. <laughs> so... Um, so I, this was February of 2010, 2010. And I was actually, yeah, I was actually working here at least five times a year. At least I was doing trade shows and national sales meetings. And I was like every other American or world citizen. I knew Las Vegas as the strip. Right. Loud, noisy, you know, all those, all those things. 
gambling, carousing, uh, sex, drugs, rock and roll. No. And I knew the city was growing because over the years I had been here many, many times, and I would look for yeah. my hotel room to see the build, the houses go further and further out to the mountains. Yeah. And I also knew it was hot, and you know it had its reputation. And sure. I so I had a job in San Diego. I think it was February, March of two thousand and ten. Okay. Um, or I forget. Actually, I forget the time of year. Oh no, it may have been may have been later. May have been like September or October. So I was in in beautiful San Diego, and mm -hmm. I'm you know anybody who goes to San Diego knows how much how wonderful it is. And I was flying back on that paradise and I land behind yeah it. paradise. Yeah. And we're I'm we're punching through the crowd clouds, and we come through the clouds into New York, and we're about to land in Newark and I look out the window and I look at New York and I look at, you know, that the Weehawken and that part of New Jersey that you can see and it's cold. <laughs> it's raining. <laughs> it's gray. It's industrial. Uh -huh. As soon as I get my luggage, it's going to be like, it's like, it's like you're like, it's like you're in the 90th round of a fight. It's like, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. You're oh, bracing because you know you're going to feel that blast. Yeah, like you're going to be exhausted. You're going to be tired. Your house is going to be like, you know, moist because of all the rain. And um, yeah. um, I landed and I was like, I got home and I did to, to, to my then wife at the time, I said, what? Why do we live here again? <laughs> what do I do it here? Because I honestly could live anywhere. I could live yeah. in San Diego. And she said, well, you're, you know, we're here because of our family and we own some right. properties. And I said, I'm, I'm ready to move. I'm ready. To yeah. Move. So in the next few months, I was and very quickly made the decision. It's like, it's time to move. I have to move. And um, looked at LA and I was like, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> hey, um, what's wrong with LA? I like <laughs> LA. <laughs> you tell me what's wrong with LA. And um, oh. then I looked at, um, we, we looked at San Diego and we just could not make the numbers work. And, and honestly, yeah. couldn't really make the numbers work in LA. Yeah. <laughs> And and then we looked at um, Orlando, and I was like, I refuse to live in Orlando. But I had to look. I actually <laughs> had to look. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure it out. And then I'm talking to a really good friend of mine who lived in Las Vegas at the time. And she said, you should look here. Look in Las Vegas. You're here all the time anyway. And I'm like, really, Las Vegas? <laughs> right? And she said, when are you back here? And I said, I'm coming back in two weeks for a trade show. She said, tack on an extra day. Change your flight, tack on an extra day. Okay. And she showed me, she got me off the strip and she right. showed me around and she showed me Henderson and mm -hmm. she showed me restaurants and she showed me stores, things that weren't on the strip. She showed yeah. me the district and she said, you know, she told me some facts about, um, the Los district. Vegas, Remind me, what's what's the district? The district's here in Henderson. It's kind of like a mini grove, but it doesn't have as many people. Oh, I think I was there once. Yeah, it's a beautiful it's place. Long, yeah. So, yeah. So then I started doing some research on law, like real like number research on Las Vegas, and I thought, right. you know what, like this is kind of a great town, and it's 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 you know there, there's no state income tax, and it's geographically a small town. So you're not going to drive as much. And yeah. um, it's social. I didn't know this, that it was a socially small town. I had no idea. But, you know, yeah. I work here a couple times a year anyway. And I can get on, depending on where we live, I can be at the airport in a very short period of time. And I can fly just about anywhere. And, you benefit. And, and then now this, now mind you, this is 2000. This is the beginning of like, this is the end of 2010, end of 2011. And she told me, like, and properties like rock bottom, they had overbuilt here. And I looked at these sure. houses and I'm like, this is just three oh, years after the big short. Oh my God. I'm like, I can buy this house for X. Because in New Jersey, where I was living at that time and had come mm -hmm. out of New York, where I had astronomical, you know, rent, the, oh, uh, the, the property taxes in New Jersey are the highest in the country. Bar <laughs> none. It. Yeah. It's the most densely populated, but also is the highest because of corruption and, you know. Yeah. And well, it's, the, it's the bedroom state to New York City. It's the bedroom state to New York and Philadelphia. What a lot of people don't realize oh, if, you, wow. if you cut huh. New Jersey in half, the northern half would go to New York and the southern half would go to Philadelphia. New Jersey huh. is the only state, the only state in the entire country that does not 
have its own local affiliates for NBC, ABC, and CBS. Whoa, I never thought about that. There's none. It's Philly, New York. Crazy. Yeah, there's no NBC, New Jersey. Hackensack. <laughs> yeah, Hackensack on the air. There's none of that. My mom's from Hackensack, yeah. Yeah. Wow, so, that's amazing. Yeah, so it's, 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 this, it's this state that is so densely populated. It's so valuable in a sense because of New York and Philadelphia and access to both cities. But it, it, in a weird way, it doesn't have its own identity be, because of that. So, mm-hmm. um, but, but, you know, the more I looked at Las Vegas, the more it made sense. And then, okay. um, my next few bookings, I, you know, got a, you know, got a realtor and he started showing me properties. And then I learned things about Las Vegas. The fact that this is, this is really a Mormon town that the Mormons were here first. They got here first yeah. and built a fort. um, all the roads to this day, meet the requirements of Brigham Young that all roads have to be six horse wide wagons that can do a U turn. <laughs> it's one of the reasons wow. all the roads in this town are so Crazy. wide. When you first move here, you're like, why are the roads so insanely I wide? Had no great. idea. It was wow. the Mormons. They were here first and they mapped out the city and how it had to be and how it, that requirement was important. And then in here in Henderson, this is the largest master plan community in the United States. Everything. Oh, wait, they hold on, out- hold on, John. What you're saying yeah. is the the city planners of Sin City are the Mormons. Is that what you're saying? Um, the Mormons, the largest community of Mormons outside of Utah are here in Las Vegas. Wow. And in fact, one of the reasons the Mormons are so incredibly rich is because when the mob was growing in Las Vegas, the only people that would loan them money were Mormon banks. Interesting. So that's why um, that's why they have a that's why the Mormons are so strong here. The LDS community church is enormous here with a massive community of people here. So, but the, but laying out of the Henderson, which, which is essentially Las Vegas, um, Mm -hmm. was very, very smart. All those parks, all those washes, all those walkways, Mm -hmm. all those tennis courts, all that stuff was planned way in advance. Wow. So when you come here, you you have access to parks, you have access to tennis courts, you have access to walkways, you have access to washes, you have access to bike parks. They were planned, you know, 30 years ago. Hmm. Which is, which is really wonderful. And then you get here and you live here and you're like, this is an incredible town. Socially, it's small. You meet you meet movie stars at parties. You're like, what the hell is he doing here? <laughs> it is kind of crazy. I, I remember getting caught up in the social circle um, before I left Vegas. And it, it is yeah. a really tight-knit uh, community. It's a really tight-knit very supportive community and it's a small town. It's a geographically small town, like yeah. I said. So you start driving less. So mm-hmm. you're saving a lot of money there. No, no, ta- no state income tax. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's just a different, it's just a different life. So I'm really, okay. I'm really glad I'm here and it's benefited me because within like six months of living here, um, uh, I got a call. I'd done a couple of like epic movie, date movie, those types of films, parody films. Uh-huh. And one of the casting directors I had worked with before on, um, uh, meet the Spartans. I got a call from her. She goes, Hey, I Hello. heard you're living in, you're living in Las Vegas. And I said, yeah, she goes, could you be here tomorrow for an audition? I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> that wouldn't have happened if I lived in New York and New Jersey, but I was able yeah. to hop in a car went to that yeah. audition, and I booked that film. And then it happened again with another film well, because and, of, and you're a quick plane ride from LA too. So you've got, you know, yeah, you're, you're 40 minutes. 40 yeah. minutes. Because I've, I've seen crazy. you since I left Vegas. I've seen you at least three times now. Since Well, then. you know, when you think about it, the fact that I can fly into LAX, even today, without coronavirus. Between or, pandemics, you know, sure, right. Between pandemics. <laughs> you know, you're talking about a flight that's like $51, $49. It's crazy. So you can fly to LA for a, like 112 bucks. Mm-hmm. I can't drive there for that much. Right. Now, you are well known for Trump, mm-hmm. but, and that your, your Trump successes and accolades, which we'll get to here in a sec, they kind of 
they kind of dwarf everything else that you've done. Which yeah, you yeah. Cover some cool ground, but just let's. Can we do like a little um, tour of uh, the other characters that you do? Is that uh, not to put you Absolutely. on the spot or anything? You know. <laughs> I always hate that people like come up to me as a comedian, like, you know, tell me something funny, you know, you're an actor, right. act for me right now. So yeah. that said, give us some characters there, Johnny. <laughs> like Austin Powers. Stacey Groovy rides on, baby. Yeah. It's me, Austin Danger Powers. Oh, behave. <laughs> you know, Austin, you're always doing the growl thing. I don't know. <laughs> Mini me. Stop pumping the laser. Okay. All right. Do you mind? I'm doing a, I'm doing an interview with Mark. Okay. All right. All right. Daddy loves you. I feel like Dr. Phil should maybe give some advice here. Hey folks, it's me, Dr. Phil, and I am so happy to be on Mark's podcast today. And I'm not just here to promote my books, my drinks, my beer not. cozies. No, I am here to tell you about my t-shirts. Oh, Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Phil. For my, for my new book, I'm Okay, You're a Mess. <laughs> of course, of course. I think maybe Guy Fieri could maybe liven things up here. Hey, everybody, it's me, Guy Fieri. I'm driving the bus to Flavortown, and Flavortown has been quarantined, baby. Mm, tastes so good. <laughs> now, Jay Leno's got to be upset because, uh, you know, he's got all those cars, and it's like, well, maybe he's happy. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Hey, everybody, it's me, Jay Leno. I'm so happy about the coronavirus that I can drive my millions of cars around Los Angeles and I and no one's on the roads. <laughs> well, we're, we're glad to, uh, that yeah. someone's going to benefit out of it, Jay. Absolutely. You know what I mean? I mean, I mean, I need a lot of money on the on the Tonight Show. I believe you. I believe you. So who else do we have out there, John? Hello, folks. It's me, Larry King. Larry King live, coming to you live from sunny Orlando. Six live, seven heart attacks. Garlic, it's unique. Tomorrow night, Tom Hanks for the full hour. He's back from Australia, and he's still in quarantine. <laughs> do, John, do you ever listen to... Um... Well, he doesn't have it now, but he used to, uh, before uh, Marvelous Ms. Maisel came along and he got that great role, um, uh, Kevin Pollack did uh, oh, God, Chat Show. That. And do you remember yeah. his, uh, his, um, uh, his, he would have his guests do, a, at the end of the show, a little send-up as Larry King with their worst Larry King impression. <laughs> so he got him off the hook. But his Christopher Walken to the, wow, his right. Walken is incredible. It's amazing. And I, his, the funniest line he ever said as Walken was, my supials don't scare me. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> but Frankenstein oh, does. I mean, he's, I actually got right. that back. You know, Frankenstein yeah. never scared me. My supials do. They dot. <laughs> <laughs> they dot. <laughs> they dot. <laughs> so brilliant. Oh, my God. What, what other characters do we have that you can dust off? Uh, That's a lot. That's a, a lot. Guy. Hold on, let me go to my website to remind me who I do. Isn't that amazing? We have so many different things you, you do as a as a entertainer. You've even like written stuff, and you're like, yeah. I, I can't remember. Let me get. Let me. Oh, I'm gonna do line. I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna do something very special that I don't do a lot, but I'm gonna do Charlie Chaplin for you. Nice. So I just did a great Pratt fall. You, you probably love it. Uh, it. It was amazing, John. I think all of our listeners really, they soaked in the nuances that you contributed to that, that sound. So thank you. I, 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 I think I already did uh, Ozzy Osbourne, man. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Ozzy. I love Ozzy. Yeah, Ozzy, man. And my favorite, oh, hold on. My voice. His is daughter's a real sweetheart. I actually... Uh, through uh, Beecher's Madhouse when I was doing the wow. Lieutenant Frank gig uh, here in L.A. There were some house parties I was hired for, and she was actually involved in kind of running a few of them. Absolute sweetheart, so. Yes, hold on. Let me do Sean Connery. Oh, yeah. My name is Bond, James Bond. <laughs> Sean, what's, is... what's the deal? Why, why do you have such a thing against Alex Trebek? What did Alex Trebek ever do to you? He's such a sweet guy. He's just trying to yeah, run. Well, he's a total wimp. He's a total wimp. 
Come on, Sean. That's a little unfair, don't you think? No, not at all. Hold on, my good friend. Regis Philbin is here. Oh, no. <laughs> so great to be on the air. I don't know why I left Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think people want to be healthy right now probably want to be a millionaire. Apparently, we <laughs> come for some uh, good health care options. Wow. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of other characters, but uh, we, we got to jump into the main act here. Um, yeah, I got to. Um, we need to wrap this up, as they say. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, I remember the night of the election. This is 2016. <laughs> and everyone on my Facebook is like going, wow. And out of all of that, you know, concern, I see this post from you where you're like, yes. <laughs> I just hit the pay dirt. I did. I, I said I hit the lottery. It's amazing. Yeah. Now, a lot I, of people will ask me this. I'm kind of curious how you respond, because I'm sure you get this question a lot, um, about how do you personally feel about Trump? What's your politics? Do you agree with him? Do you disagree with him? Oh, I, you know, my thing is I work for, you know, Fox News. I appear on Fox News and I appear on Conan yeah. O'Brien. So Red my, Eye, Fox and Friends. I, yeah, my feeling is I don't, you know, my political views are irrelevant. My job is to do him as right best as I can. You know, one of the first things I learned at uh, Bob's School of Acting. Was, <laughs> no, I did actually learn this when I studied in New York that um, yeah. you have to, at the very least, like your character. If you can, you should love your character. Sure. Otherwise, hate your character creates this kind of internal disconnect. Yeah, which, yeah. You know, which you can see in some people who do him. And honestly, you know, I'm an entertainer. I love to entertain people. So right. I don't see any reason to alienate half my audience. So either um, way, yeah, yeah sure. either way. Either way. So, you know, my thing is my, my, and, 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 and really when you get right down to it, 99.9% .9 of the population, you don't need to know their political affiliation. Uh, when I was a kid, no sure. one talked politics the way they talk politics now. Well, especially since the coronavirus. Anyone was. Well, you didn't know what anyone was. We live in this time yeah. where everyone wonders their politics yeah. on their sleeve. And guess what? No one gives a shit about your <laughs> uninformed opinion. Right. <laughs> You know, that's I, you're answering what I sensed you would answer, uh, is that when people have asked me, that's I, I gave a version of that. I would say, well, you know, it, it's he's got a lot of people that love his Trump because they hate Trump. But he's done stuff on Fox, you know, News Red Eye. He's done it on Fox and Friends. So it's like it kind of, you know, not to be uh, impertinent, but your question is kind of irrelevant to what John does. He just does this Trump character that, you know. Oh, and I have people. people reach out to me all the time and they're like, I love your Trump. I hope you love him. You know, I hope you, and it's like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. You love the performance. Yeah. That's yeah. all I need to do. Watch right. my material. Exactly. You know, I'm going to make it funny. I'm not a mean person. So no matter who I'm doing, it would never be like a vicious kind of um, uh, characterization of, of whoever it is. Right. So you've been you've done Fox, you've been on Conan. We mentioned that uh, you're also on Chelsea. I was the oh. voice of Trump on Chelsea six times. Nice. And I've been on the Today Show in Australia ten times as Trump, and those wow. usually run six to seven minutes, and they're improvised. I've been on this morning the number one morning show in England, actually in the entire UK. I've done that six times, and I've done an actual in studio appearance for them. I've done the Irish Today Show. I've done the U.S. Today Show. I was profiled by the New York Times, profiled by the Washington Post three different times. I mean, the the level of exposure that I've received is just, it's amazing. It's amazing. The funny thing is, though, it doesn't stick because um, no one sees me out of character. So, <laughs> you know, if I was on a, if I was on a sitcom, and I was just a regular actor and you knew who yeah, I was. Yeah. If I had done over 300 interviews in a two year period, you'd be sick of me. Um, because <laughs> be, why is this guy on again? But because I'm doing a character, uh, I'm doing a, 
performing as Trump. It doesn't right. stick to me, John D. Domenico. It's that that Trump impersonator guy. But right. if, you know, I look at the fact that I have been on Conan fifty times, and most people don't know it. Right. Uh, right. So. Now, uh, a lot of people, when you say to them the phrase Donald Trump impersonation, the first thing that comes to their mind, of course, is Saturday Night Live and right. Alec Baldwin's performance. So the mm-hmm. inevitable question, of course, is uh, two part. Have you ever met Alec Baldwin? And what's his take on what you do? Well, Alec Baldwin was, I just worked with him recently. He was super complimentary. He said to my face on stage, you're good. You're really good. He said to the audience, can, can you do that as Alec, not to put you in the spot. But I don't do really know Alec how to do his that? voice. No, <laughs> I do know how to say um, as him, um, I'm Alec Baldwin. And here's the thing. Right. Oh, isn't that a great it's podcast? Very, Oh, it's it's a great podcast. And my guest today is the recently deceased Elaine Strict. She played my mother on 30 Rock. I I don't know if I'm listening to a better NPR or I'm about to have sex when I listen to (laughs) Here's the Thing. It's just his voice, the way he does it. The way he says it, it's so amazing. Master, yeah. You feel like you're in in an old, old timey radio play. You know, it's crazy. He's amazing. He's amazing. But he's been very complimentary. And, um, you know, I think a high tide lifts all boats. As long as there's somebody out there, you know, Anthony Dominic was doing the president show. Anybody doing Trump on television, that just helps me. You know what I mean? Sure. It, it's a huge help. Um, you know, people see him. They obviously are not going to get him for an event. So they'll get me for an event. Or in the case when I met him, they got me and him, which was very oh, nice. Now, as I understand it, you were you were hired to do perform at the event and then on the set list you exit the stage and then Alec Baldwin was going to come on be next and you know if it went according to plan you were just supposed to fuck off because you did your thing and then Alec right. goes on and it proceeds what actually happened so what was happened is amazing this whole event is for um um, all the a lot of Democratic politicians in California, specifically for um, an assemblyman named Evan Lowe, who's a rising star in Democratic politics. Okay. And I was just supposed to just like you said, come up, do the handoff. It was as right. simple as that. And he came up as he's walking up the steps. He's looking at me going, you're good. <laughs> oh, my God. Really I just good. got chills. You're really good. Yeah, and I'm like, wow. <laughs> I'm in London. And he said, and I said, I are just like penetrating, like looking at you, like you're the only yeah. thing that exists in his world at that moment. So I said, so I said, Alec, the stage is yours. And he goes, You're not going anywhere. <laughs> I said, What? I said, what? He goes, No, 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 no. He goes, You're not going anywhere. He goes, um, can we get some chairs up here on stage? Wow. I'm like, What's happening? Yeah. And he says, I want to interview you. I want to, I want to interview you. You're really good. You're really good. So chairs appear on stage and I sit down next to him. This is is not on the program. Not on the program. And Evan, who's kind of like, what is happening? This is supposed (laughs) to be about me. (laughs) What's happening? So, um, so, uh, what a moment. So he says, you know, folks, I do Trump on SNL every two weeks. I'm, Sure. Five or six minutes. And he goes, I- I'm I'm terrible. I'm ter- right. And, and he says to me, Isn't it like unanimous that I'm like the worst Trump in the world? And I said, Well, I said, you and I was trying to be diplomatic. And he goes, sure. It's fine. I'm sure. horrible. He yeah. goes, but this guy just did 12 minutes in character. He wrote all the material and he knocked it out of the park. So give him a nice round of applause. And then he says, Who wow. are you? Wow. Wow. Yeah. So that was very, very it was it was just it it you know, I had talk about I, validation. Oh my God. I, I called my, my congratulations. Girl, and I said, <laughs> she was like, how did it go? And I said, it went better. <laughs> you could imagine. <laughs> possibly could have imagined. Wow. And then a couple of days ago, you're minding your own business and you wake up and your phone is just blowing up. What happened a couple of days ago? Well, there's, um, you know, I did a viral video and there's been a couple. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not the only one, but there's been a couple, one's floating around and one guy and one's floating around. I like around the one you do on the border. 
when people are sneaking across the border. Oh, that's great. I, oh, the wall. Oh, my yeah, God. That's an amazing, amazing video. We'll, we'll throw a link of, to that one and other oh, stuff yeah. that you suggest to me on in the. Uh, the so um, so um, he was looking. Howard has his own Trump on the show and he's had, you know, he's had obviously had Baldwin on. He's had Anthony and Dominic on. But he had heard about me because one of my videos had gone viral. So he played it and was very, very complimentary. And I <clears throat> what's happened is. I'll wake up some mornings because I'm obviously three hours behind the East Coast and I'll get messages and someone will say, you were really funny on Howard Stern today. And I'm like, not me. That's another guy. <laughs> and, like, and I've gotten the habit of doing that because I obviously sure. know when I'm on the show. Yeah. And yeah. then I got yeah. up and I had an email from a friend saying, dude, you were awesome on Howard Stern today. Congratulations. And I was writing that person back saying, that wasn't me. And right, then another right. one came. And then another one came in and then one came in as a, as a text that it, they said, Hey, they're playing your video on Howard Stern and they're mentioning you by name. And then oh, I was wow. like, Oh, now I get it. Now I get it. And that's, that's what happened. As if the Alex so Baldwin I, endorsement wasn't enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, Chris, you know, Hey, Alex Baldwin is a big guy, but Trump has 25 million listeners so this was a big deal. stern uh, howard stern big, stern 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 yeah you're so deep howard? in it you said trump howard. <laughs> this is how much trump Sorry. permeates your your he's, yeah he's he's all over my brain understandable you're yeah, on so howard that was, stern that was that was very nice and i tried to leverage it as much as possible i had somebody send me the audio clip i converted it into a video clip and had photos and that went out and that's been getting it's, some traction it's too. almost tell me how you feel like i kind of feel like it's almost better than if you were on as a guest because it's like people are just for who don't already know you they're discovering you through howard's discovery of you because when you see yeah, that those moments of, of howard and robin going like who is this guy is he's amazing yeah. he's, isn't it great and they're literally like discovering you in that moment and i just i i was so happy for you when i saw that i thought oh my god like you could not have crafted a better promo <laughs> for my buddy yeah. johnny and, and what what howard else? just did this is a minor thing but it means the world to me the fact that he pronounced my name right was oh yeah huge huge Amazing, amazing. And what's also amazing, John, not to segue here, because a little something that I do, but you have been an amazing not only member, but you also donated uh, some of what you do as an artist to my cause, Hero Tear. Uh, and you actually moved very quickly. A couple of weeks ago, we had a, a very small time window. We thought that Benka's hotel room that a charity uh, put up for her was going to be lost at the end of the week. So we're trying to uh, get as many hero tears involved so we could get her direct cash aid so she could keep the room. Turns out she did. We did not hit our goal, but because you acted quickly, John, and you were so generous to uh, donate a shout out video for our hero tear operation, keep home cards for hero tears contest. And that resulted in over a hundred dollars of direct aid to Banka in literally less than a week, really about 48 to 72 hours. So she really very much appreciated that. And you created this video. I think I talked to you and just said, hey, John, I know you're busy, but if you got a moment, I was even imagining you'd do a video. Within like 24 hours, you cranked out this great promo video as Trump with your setup that you've got there. You got the flags in the, on either side. You got the, the yeah. presidential seal. And it was, it was more than I could possibly hope for. And it was super generous and really effective and now as i you know continue to build out your tier it's a great example i can show other artists of hey this is what johnny b did yeah did you saw him on howard stern yeah well this is what he did for here tier so just your generosity is legendary and i'm just i'm so grateful and i want to thank you here publicly for doing that well, um, thank you i i i, I th and thank you for you know doing what you do it's not everyone you know has the intestinal fortitude to help other people the way you're helping them. Well, you're too, you're too kind. I, I kind of feel like, and hopefully this doesn't, you know, die down. Like I think it did a little after nine 11, I feel like 
people's awareness of their fellow human beings and how much we're connected and how much, you know, the health and welfare of our fellow human beings directly impacts our health and welfare, regardless right. of what class we're in or what our race is or what country we live in or how much money we have or don't have. All of that's irrelevant. It's like, you know, like you said earlier, you know, uh, the rising tide lifts all boats. So right. hopefully we can all learn from that. Now, Speaking of learning, I understand you are in a documentary on Amazon. Tell us about that. Oh, no, it's not a documentary. It's a narratively structured show. Oh, okay. Called, my bad. My bad. Yeah, it's called Fake News, uh, Fake News, a Trump Story. And it's a day in the life of Trump. It's the day he opens his presidential library. <laughs> and every and he's not getting the press he wants, so he either fakes a health crisis or it actually happens it's up to you to decide uh-oh well i don't know if you could get a better tease than that i think you guys need to go watch yeah. and if you have amazon prime you can watch it for free tonight please watch rate and review and we have the amazing angela hoover who plays um who, who plays all of the female characters which is just incredible now, I understand you have been really busy lately since um, live performance characters such as, as yourself suddenly cannot uh, do that work because of the pandemic. And I know myself as a, a busker uh, and as a, an actor, the production shut down, so I can't get the acting work right now. And I can't go out on Hollywood Boulevard or really anywhere else to go busking. There's no sports events to go to either. So all that shut down. But what you've done... Uh, you're on Cameo now. What, what is that? And uh, what, well, what, what are you doing I, I, on it? You know, one of the things I did early on was, because I do a lot of voiceover work, I built a studio, right. an audio studio in my house. So that's a big help. And then I built If I team. can interrupt for a quick second, everyone, sure. as I previously mentioned, <laughs> I'm talking into the built-in speaker on a grandpa laptop. <laughs> so that's why Johnny sounds so much better than I do. But don't worry, the cable's in the mail, quote unquote. Next week, it should sound better. So, yeah. Back to you, Johnny. Cameo. Yeah. So I, I, I built an audio studio. And then I, you know, I, I, before Trump got elected, I started building a White House press room set because, uh, well, I, after right. he was elected. And then because I right. was going to do press. And um, the great thing is, the ter there's so many downsides to this coronavirus, but he's in the, the press room now on a much more regular basis. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm shooting videos left and right. And that video, the what went viral, what was on Howard Stern was shot on my set. I also do the cameos. Right. I do client videos. The cameos are amazing because um, I shot six of them yesterday and three wow. just came in today. And they're coming in usually every single day, which is really right. awesome. So, so you're shooting them practically every day right now. Pretty much. Uh, today, I mean, three came in today. I won't shoot there till tomorrow, only because I'm very tired and uh, getting in, being in makeup for 12 hours at a time is just exhausting. Cool. And um, and when and, I'm doing longer videos, it's a lot of, it's a lot of copy. So. Well, know. and thank you again, John, for, you know, your time to be on the podcast today because I realize how much, how busy you are because, uh, you know, the retooling, it's a lot of work. And that's, can we take a quick moment? Cause we, we referenced that earlier. What is it like for you as far as a financial investment, an emotional investment, and also like a time preparation investment to be this character, Donald Trump? Well, to be, you know, th this is my personal, personal professional thing. It doesn't matter which character I do. Um, I like to do them a hundred percent. I come from a theater background. I'm trained as an actor. I'm, I even hate the term impersonator to tell you the truth. Really? Um, I hate tribute artists. I cannot stand that phrase. <laughs> Interesting. Um, yeah. I am. Like, who, who did no one consulted me. Um, <laughs> and I'm the one working the most. So, right. um, but, uh, I approach these as a actor performing, a char I'm a I'm a character I, as if as if this were a movie or a play right. or a TV show. That's how I approach it. And if I'm going to do that, I'm going to do it right. I'm going to I'm going to be my own wardrobe person. I'm going to be my own makeup person. I'm going to be my own wig person. Mm -hmm. um, 
on that on the set. Uh, but I've always believed in making the investment. When I first started doing Trump, I went to Bob Kelly. Bob Kelly did all the Broadway shows. He bought all the wigs for all the Broadway shows. He had his own mm. makeup line. He even did the wig um, for a Trump commercial where Trump had to end up in a dumpster pulling out a um, a credit card. I bought that wig. Wow. And, so I've always set the bar very, very high. My father right. said, even though we had no money, you'll never be sorry if you buy the best. Not the right. most expensive, but if you buy the best, right. you'll never be sorry. Right. And I've always taken that to heart. So I've, um, you know, I would, you know, went to college, taught makeup classes, but when it was time to learn the makeup for each of my characters, I went to a makeup artist and we broke it down on a, uh, on a worksheet where what what's what and that's my makeup my wigs my wigs are four thousand dollars each i oh well, hold have, on how much they're four thousand dollars wow they're handmade they're hand pulled um every single hair every single individual hair is pulled through the french lace cap which is custom to my head Wow. Yeah. And I did that. Bob Kelly did my wigs in New York and when they were really expensive there, but my wig person (laughs) here is Cirque. So um, it's, it's worth it for the corporate work for any work I do TV film. I've done films where they've used my wigs. Wow. Because it was better than what the production had offered. The The wig from the James Franco thing. That was my wig. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So I, I always believe in spending the money. My Austin power suits, I bought probably 12, 13, 14 years ago. Mm-hmm. I paid $1,800 a suit. Wow. They were custom made, but I wear those suits to this day because they are well constructed and they were designed for my purposes. I told right. the guy exactly what I wanted. Right. I made the investment and the investment has paid off. It is a true investment. Sure. There is a return on that investment. So that's why I buy the best, spend the money, because the money will come back tenfold. And that's what I've always believed in. So my Trump, my ties are Trump ties. My shirts are $125 French cuff shirts. Um, you know, the makeup is not, you know, the makeup is the best makeup that I know how to <laughs> use, you know, but everything I have elevator shoes that are very expensive. You know, the suits are, are the same boxy suits that Trump wears. I, I found out what kind of watch he wore and I found a replica of that. Now I, you clearly, this is a, uh, your work is your passion. You love doing it, but I got to wonder, I know what, how I feel at the end of the day when I perform how do you feel at the end of the day when you've just done uh, even six uh, cameo video shout outs? Oh, I feel Trump. lucky. I feel so grateful to be able to do this. And I've always felt grateful to make a living doing this, but to be able to do it now when a lot of people just are not working, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. What's your energy level when you're done? Oh, it's, it's you know, it's pretty, it's relief. <laughs> Because now I get to take the makeup off. As much as I love putting the makeup yeah, on, taking yeah. it off is even better. Gotcha. So. Gotcha. All right, man. How do we find you on Cameo and any other? I just put Cameo and put in uh, Johnny D 23 and I will come up. It's and... also my it's also my Twitter and it's also my Instagram. Fantastic. And I imagine what's next until the pandemic ends is you're doing more cameos, right? More cameos, more voiceovers. Um, obviously, I'm the voice for Trump for a number of things, but I'm trying to get right, some regular right. voiceover work too. And, um, you know, uh, I know that, uh, you know, I'll do anything I can. But right now, cameo is really filling the days and the voiceover work is filling the days. How do people, I imagine that would be through your representation for the voiceover work? How do people reach out to Yeah, you? I'm handled by Buck Walden Associates for the, um, for the voiceover work. So you you can go, you know, the website, which is johnnyd.net. Nice. John, thank you so much for your time today. I, this, I think this was an invaluable, uh, whether you were a fan of what you do, just kind of get some nice behind the scenes, cool stories, whether you're, you know, a fellow actor want to know a little bit, you know, behind the curtain, you know, inside the actor's studio as it were since we don't have james lifton anymore 
uh, I think uh, people from a lot of different, uh, you know, stations in life and professions are really going to enjoy this interview we just had. And I'm just super grateful that I got to have it with you. And I'm just grateful to have you as a friend and as a colleague, brother. You're a mensch of a guy. What can I, I say? The same way. I feel the same way. Stay healthy, social distance, stay positive, test negative. <laughs> Is, do we have a last word from uh, the president, perhaps? Say that out? again. Can we get a, a final word from the president of the United States? As a oh, absolutely. Here? Listen, everyone. It's made the greatest president in the history of presidents. Don't worry about a thing. Don't worry about a thing. By mid-April, this whole thing's going to disappear because it's going to get warm and it can't stand the heat. It can't stand the heat or fire. So I think we should, you know, light it on fire. Let's light this puppy up. What could go wrong? Is John not a machine or what? Also, what a match. That guy's just a peach. He's an amazing human being as well as a phenomenal artist. I, I'm just grateful lucky I get to uh, I gotta count someone like that as a friend. I definitely did not meet people like uh, Johnny in the mortgage business. I can tell you that for certain. Yeah. Mark, are you saying that that artists and entertainers are better than people in the mortgage business? Uh, yeah. <laughs> are you kidding me? Yeah, sorry, mortgage peeps. Yeah, just, I mean, fruit on the tree. Fruit on the tree. So any links to stuff mentioned on the show, you can find at markromanempire.com. By the way, guys, I know there's some jingly jangly stuff going on. I, I'm fixing these audio issues each week. We're getting better. Building this empire brick by brick. So thanks for hanging in there with me. Okay. Did I mention that the pandemic canceled my acting and busking income? I think you probably know that by now. So if you'd like more podcast, your Venmo, Cash App, or even PayPal is truly appreciated. Even a buck, one dollar. Hey, it all adds up. MarkRomanEmpire.com. Click tip jar. Or if you're listening on SoundCloud, I know a lot of you do, there's a new link to my Venmo there as well. Look for the blue support Mark Roman Empire button. Thanks to all our listeners across the globe. I see you, Thetford Center, Vermont, Toronto in the O, Canada. And last week, I said Amsterdam, New York. This week, I can say the Amsterdam we all know and love. Amsterdam in the Netherlands. No, not your nethers, Lieutenant Frank. The Netherlands. Spread the news. Are you a hero tier? We have been helping house Venka and Will since December 2019. We hero tiers have been helping creatives since St. Patrick's Eve 2020. We need 3,000 to bring Vink and Will and their puppy Andy home. Leave no human outside. Also, only Hero Tears could win cool prizes in the weekly Cards for Hero Tears game. We had to do that on our YouTube channel, Mark Roman Empire on YouTube. What prizes, you ask? Well, how about an autographed and personalized Hollywood Wolverine photo? which you can also get if you support my fellow creatives as a double down here tier. Yeah, just go ahead and buy it, but you can also win it. This week, Megan Moore won an autographed 77th Academy Awards poster, which was donated by poster designer himself and hero tier, Brett Davidson of Brett Davidson Creative. You know, I spoke to Megan today, and apparently watching the Oscars is kind of a big deal for her and her friends at their annual Oscars watch party. She's pretty excited about her prize. Who will win next? What will they win? Watch Cards for Here Tears number six, which should be out Monday. Yeah, I think Monday's for Cards for Here Tears, which also teases the next episode of the podcast, which drops on... Wednesdays. Hey, I think I'm getting the swing of my schedule. We found 44 here tears since December. Who's next? Whether you need help or you can offer help, or maybe you're just curious, 
Visit herotier.org to discover more. And you can listen to the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks to those who already have. It does help the podcast grow. You can also hear on Mixcloud, Podbean. I mentioned SoundCloud, Stitcher, and TuneIn. Uh, as I mentioned on the YouTube, we do have the podcast audio as well as the interview wrap and teasers and Cards for Hero Tears videos. MarkRomanEmpire.com. Click listen. To avoid missing out on cool stuff, join my mailing list. The Mark Roman Empire census. Yeah, not the other census. Uh, I got to fill mine out too. I know, I know. So there's so many things to do. I'm talking about the Mark Roman Empire census. Yeah, it's a different kind of census. You know, sometimes we have special deals and perks for podcast citizens like you. This week's Sermo Maximus is... Ooh, I got to think of one. Johnny is Trump, right? Johnny is Trump. That's the Sermo Maximus, guys. So check your email for this week's episodes. Census. But only if you want to win a cool prize to be drawn in next week's Cards for Hero Tears. And if you didn't get it, become a citizen. You go to markromanempire.com, click Census. And that's where you can enter in the Sermo Maximus I just shared with you. I'll share it with you a third time. Johnny is Trump. Twitter at the Mark Roman, Instagram at Mark Roman Empire for the podcast, at Vegas90210 for Lieutenant Frank and the other characters. <laughs> Email your questions to me at RomanPodMail at gmail.com. I did not check it again this week. <laughs> I'm going to get to it, guys. But, you know, you guys got to write in, too, all right? I'd love to have a bunch stack up and we can get to them in future podcasts because I just might answer them. Who knows? Let's see. Okay, guys, I'm just, I, you know what? I'm, I'm getting the schedule right here. I feel like I'm getting things dialed in, getting things the way they want to go. There's a lot of stuff I was feeling really busy with, and now I feel like I can breathe a little bit. Uh, I just uh, messaged Sammy Obey. You heard him on a few previous episodes. He's got a really cool new uh, comedy show that he's doing on Zoom. So if you're looking for stuff to do, look up uh, Sammy Obey. He's got a really cool collection of comics that he's curated. It's like going to a comedy club a comedy show that's run by the Sammy Obey, the guy running for president 2036, the guy who's done comedy a thousand and one nights in a row. He met, set that world record. He's got his own comedy club now. It's virtual, but uh, check it out. Um, go to our previous episode. I think it's Sammy KO comedy.com. I don't know. It should be a message. Ask me. Look, Sammy Obey. He's on social media. Sammy Obey on Instagram. He's got his info there. Sammy's awesome. I love Sammy. Guys, I gave you a big, huge, hearty, packed full episode. Do you like it? I kind of like I kind of dug this interview. I got a cool one for you next week. Did the interview earlier today. Yeah, it's another Twitter verified who follows yours truly, the Mark Roman on the Twitter. So it'd be kind of that'll be the third week in a row next week. So I'm working on four, guys. Follow me. Can I do it? I got like 40 people following me on Twitter who are verified. It's like uh, Danny Carvey. Let's see here. You ever hear Barack Obama? Tom Cruise? You ever hear those guys? Yeah. Selena Tan from Crazy Rich Asians? I mean, have I met these people? No, but they're following me on Twitter. I'm just saying. And one of them I never even met. I reached out to this person. And I interviewed them today. You're going to hear that person, a verified who follows me on Twitter, next week's episode. Stay tuned. And until next week, remember, it takes a busker. Also remember our fallen buskers, Clown Alan Monroe, Prince St. Paul, Christopher Dennis, and Alexander Desser. No fear, hero tear. I am the... 
Mark Roman.